Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we we'll call our, our meeting to order. Um, but before we begin, uh, I would like to ask members um, that they are indeed content to revise our agenda today, included in the table items, um, and in terms of the additional briefing that we're taking on youth services. However, also indicate and acknowledge uh, request that we would indeed consider a, a further oral briefing session or indeed stakeholder engagement session with uh, an inclusive uh, range of youth organisations and youth services as well, if members are, are content with the revised agenda on those terms. Yeah? Yes. yes. That's great. Um, okay, can I advise those members in the public gallery that they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. They can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi, password details of which are available on the gallery rules, and remind you that it is not permitted to take photographs or record any of the meeting. Okay, members, first item is apologies. Um, are members aware of any apologies? Daniel McCrossan. Have Daniel McCrossan noted yet, and uh, Robbie Butler has indicated a, a need to attend a, another session at half ten. Otherwise, content? Okay. Item two, members, is chairperson's business. Advise members that I and the deputy chairperson met informally with the Education Authority Board on Thursday, the 29th of January, 2020. EAA board members raised a number of issues in respect of post-16 provision, school improvement, inspection, EOTIS, entitlement framework, signature projects, use of IT in education, treatment of vulnerable children in the education system, uh, school budgets, and a wide range of other issues, in addition to uh, the possibility of considering previous committee inquiry recommendations. Uh, most of these have been added to the draft forward work programme, which we will consider later. And, uh, would members agree to add briefings on the EOTIS provision, numeracy and literacy signature projects, School Improvement Inspection to the Forward Work Programme. Agreed? Yes. Agreed? Okay. Would it, can I also advise members that a member of the Education Authority Board suggested that the committee um, take a measured approach in terms of a, additional uh, inquiry and investigation um, before we would undertake a good comprehensive review of all previous committee inquiry recommendations. Can I suggest to members then, uh, owing to the large number of predecessor committee recommendations, that the clerk review the more recent education committee inquiries and compile a list of those recommendations um, which remain outstanding. Uh, this list will then be considered at our committee planning session next week after which the committee may elect a right to the department seeking an update on implementation of those recommendations. Members content with that as a way forward? Agreed? Yeah. Okay. Okay, members, draft minutes uh, of the meeting of 29th of January 2020 are available at page 6. Uh, are members content to agree the minutes as a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Yep. Yeah. Agreed? Okay. In terms of matters arising, member, there are no matters arising. Uh, any members, any to add? <coughs> no. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, members. Agenda item five is our education authority oral briefing, which will cover an overview of education authority matters and financial issues. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the clerk at page thirteen? and a draft copy of the Education Authority Annual Report and Accounts for 2018 to 19 at page 24. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the Education Authority in tabled items and advise members that the session will be reported by Hansard. Can I welcome our Education Authority officials uh, to the Education Committee today? Uh, we have uh, Ms. Sarah Long, Chief Executive of the Education Authority, Mr. Seamus Wade, Director Acting for Finance and ICT at the Education Authority, Ms. Claire Duffield, Director of Human Resources, Mr. Dale Hanna, Director Acting for Operations and Estates, Ms. Kim Scott, Director Acting for Education, 
and Ms Una Turbot, Assistant Director for Children and Young People's Services. You're very welcome to the committee today. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us at this early stage of our committee pr proceedings. Um, <coughs> obviously, have a wide range of issues to cover, and we look forward to doing that with you. Uh, can I invite officials to make a short presentation of no more than 15 minutes, and then be glad to give questions and take answers? Thanks very much indeed, sir. Okay, thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak to the committee today, and I look forward to working with you all to address the many challenges that are currently facing the education sector. Before addressing some of those challenges, I do want to first pay tribute to the work of all our teachers, school leaders, governors, youth workers, and the broad range of educational support staff who provide high quality services to our children and young people every day. Our vision is to inspire, support and challenge all our children and young people to be the best that they can be. And we can only achieve that through the multidisciplinary workforce who have such a huge impact on the lives of our children every day. Chair, I don't intend to go through your organisational structure and the papers, etc. that were provided in your briefing paper. I will briefly outline the role of the EA um, and some of our financial challenges. And then, as you say, we'd be happy to take more detailed questions on that. First, by way of introduction, and I'm sure all members will be aware, EA was established in April 2015, replacing the five education and library boards and the regional staff commission as a regional authority with responsibility for the delivery of education services. We have a statutory duty to deliver and implement DE policies and to de develop strategies which will help improve the education system, and we do this while working in partnership with other organisations and stakeholders and our sectoral partners in CSSC, CCMS, CNAG, NICE and the GBA. EA is the funding authority for all schools in Northern Ireland. We are also the statutory planning authority for all schools in Northern Ireland with overall responsibility for planning sufficient education provision for all school types and phases. We are the managing authority for 522 controlled schools and we are the implementing body for the departmental school improvement policy, every school a good school. We provide support to children and young people with special educational needs, maintaining over 19,000 statements. <coughs> and provide a range of support services to our schools, such as school meals and school maintenance, and we transport 90,000 children from home to school every day. We deliver a capital programme of over £77 million and have an estate of over £2 billion. EA also has a statutory responsibility to provide youth services. These activities support are complementary to and are driven by the range of education related aspects on the programme for government. We are Northern Ireland's biggest employer with over 44,000 staff, including over 8,000 teachers, 23,000 school based staff, and 13,000 non school based <coughs> staff, such as our transport staff, our youth workers, and our headquarters staff. As the employing authority for teachers in control schools, we are responsible for the management of teaching and professional and principal appointments in control schools and for the provision of teacher professional learning across all schools. EA also has a statutory duty to encourage, facilitate and promote shared education and the community use of school premises and to support the Department of Education in its statutory duty to encourage and facilitate the development of Irish medium and integrated education. I accept that there are key challenges that we need to meet in, as an authority in terms of our service delivery. And my first day commitment was to improve our communication with our schools and with the public. We have been working hard since the beginning of this year to address that matter, to improve our communications and to help restore and rebuild our relationship with our schools. Our customer services charter has been agreed and training is currently underway for all our staff. The Charter seeks to make our processes easier to understand and will ensure that we reflect on and respond to criticism and complaints in a timely manner. In addition, we have also sought to improve our engagement with schools and a range of initiatives have been undertaken this year, including our Leading Together Principals Conferences, our Open Conversation events with staff and school leaders right across the region and our Locality Leadership Network development across our three localities. 
These initiatives have provided opportunities for senior leaders in schools to build and improve relationships with local EA officers who support and advise on our regional services. A consistent area of feedback from the open conversations with school leaders that have taken place is the challenge in relation to the delivery of services for children with special educational needs. I have also met directly with parents and with other stakeholder organisations and they have also outlined many problems that they encounter with the process. I commissioned an audit of practice in this area and am currently in receipt of its findings. While this is subject to an internal process and therefore it would not be appropriate for me to discuss the, the detail of the findings, the committee can be assured that as an immediate first step an improvement team has been put in place to take forward its recommendations. Budgetary, areas, budgetary pressures in this area are significant, however, and we are acutely aware of the challenges faced by principals as resources have been affected by increased demand and a decreased budget. It is also important to note that the new SEN framework will provide additional budgetary pressures in this area. Area planning is another key service challenge for the EA. A review of the strategic area plan has been undertaken by the Strategic Investment Board and officers are working with SIB to meet timescales for submitting a report to the department. Engagement events have taken place with CCMS and our <coughs> sectoral partners and we have also engaged with principals for their input into the review. As a key member of and chair of management side, a key priority for us has to be the conclusion of the teachers pay settlement. Members will know that there is an agreement between management side and trade union side that not only addresses pay, but also involves a number of key work streams. There is a real opportunity here to move forward positively together, and I would not want that opportunity lost in the absence of a pay settlement. In relation to the financial pressures, we would be happy to take more detailed questions, but to highlight at a high level at this stage, as I've already indicated, resources have been affected by increased demand and a decreased budget. The EA resource budget for 1920 is just over £2 billion, and approximately 99% of this is spent directly in schools or <coughs> on services supporting schools, children and young people. It is estimated that after delivering in-year savings of over £20 million, spend will exceed budget this year by approximately £30 million. And that is after our in-year allocations through the September and January monitoring rounds. As I say, Seamus can talk through the detail um, in any questions that the committee may have. However, it is important to, to highlight that school, to school deficits continue to rise despite actions taken over a number of years by school leaders to reduce their salary bills and to curtail other school running costs. Many school leaders believe that the budgets available are insufficient and that they can do no more, and that the quality of teaching and learning offering provided to the children and young people is being affected. Many school principals have described to us as intolerable the increasing strain on school leaders as they struggle with ever-diminishing resources to try to meet the needs of their children and the expectations of their parents. They note particularly the impact on their ability to meet the requirements of those with special or additional educational needs. As members will be aware, these functions are delivered against the backdrop of a challenging financial landscape. Members will note that the Education Authority budget has reduced in real terms by £229 million since 2010-11. And on top of this, the EA have delivered savings of approximately £100 million since its establishment. The system requires additional funding and support to ensure that DE, EA, school leaders and governors can sustain the improvements that have been made in educational outcomes to date. This will enable the increasing requirements of children and young people to be addressed and will facilitate transformation to the system to ensure that it, continue, that it can continue to fulfil the important role that education plays in Northern Ireland communities and in achieving programme for government outcomes to contribute to a vibrant economy and a healthy population. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. That concludes my opening remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we obviously wholly agree with the tribute that you've paid to our staff in the education sector. 
and we are also acutely aware of the intoler intolerable financial circumstances in which many of our uh, teaching staff endeavour to <coughs> serve our children and young people. Um, we are, as the Education Authority have have acknowledged previously, in a financial crisis of education. Can you explain to the committee how we got to that crisis and what precise measures are being taken to move us beyond it? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I think in previous uh, presentations you've heard some of the financial challenges in terms of how we got here, but effectively um, the school spend is predominantly um, constituted of uh, payroll spend, and uh, schools typically spend about 80% of their funding on staff costs. The, the sector hasn't had pay inflation rises over the last four or five years, and really, um, whilst schools have taken many measures to try and restrict <coughs> Um, the impact, um, those measures and that um, lack of funding um, over the last number of years is really starting to bite. Similarly, the Education Authority and the services it provides to support schools, um, about 80% are costs, are staffing costs, and um, similarly, uh, in the absence of um, inflationary uplifts to pay costs, that issue is having a very, very significant impact on schools and on the Education Authority's ability to support schools. Um, uh, members will also be aware from previous conversations of the increasing demands that we have in our services, particularly around the, the needs of children in our schools with special and additional educational needs. So um, effectively, those are the, the primary reasons why we find ourselves in the very challenging circumstances that we are today. And what precise measures can EA take or level of investment do you assess is required to move us beyond what has been described as a, a crisis and an intolerable situation? Okay. So um, I guess in terms of the measures we can take, um, at the Education Authority we have sought to use all possible means of avoiding um, cuts having to be applied at school level. Um, we have done everything we can to protect the services we provide to our children and young people. That's our absolute priority. Um, over the last four or five years since the establishment of the Education Authority, we have secured savings of £100 million pounds from our uh, core budgets. In terms of school level, um, our finance teams work very closely with schools um, on an annual basis as part of their financial planning process and schools have been working with us to try and establish whether there are efficiencies or reductions in costs that they can make without impacting um, severely on the outcomes for children and young people. Um, we have um, over a thousand schools. We meet with um, those schools in the run-up to the start of the new financial year. We have a process for prioritising which of those schools require, I guess, the most intense support and challenge in some cases. So schools have been working very closely with us to look at potentially some of the measures that other schools who don't find themselves in quite the same difficult circumstances to look at the measures that they have been able to implement. Um, many school leaders, as Sarah has highlighted, simply find themselves in a position where they have um, full enrolment numbers. They have um, reduced their support staff at school level. They have made teacher redundancies where that's possible. They effectively meet the remaining um, department's sustainable schools criteria, and yet they find themselves in a situation where their financial position is steadily worsening and those schools who might have had surpluses in previous years are finding that the surpluses are diminishing rapidly and that they're projecting that they're going to be moving into deficit. So I guess schools are, are working very closely with us. Um, our local management of schools teams um, offer the opportunity to meet with every single school. We prioritise our support 
the support is um, cross directorate. It incorporates the input from our finance team, but also importantly, the school development service, because we want to be absolutely clear that as our financial position becomes more challenging, that we are working with schools to ensure that the decisions they make are sustainable from a, a curriculum perspective and from a, an outcomes perspective. Okay, I'm keen to bring members in, but I just want to ask one key question before I do that as well. The, the, just in terms of the, the seriousness of the, the situation, the, the former Education Authority CEO uh, said two years ago that without radical investment and radical reform, our education system could be unaffordable, socially immobile and unfit for the 21st century. Is that an analysis with which you agree, Sarah? Well, it's certainly unaffordable, Chair, at this point, yes. Okay. And therefore, what, what levels of radical investment and what type of radical reform <coughs> does the Education Authority propose? In terms of radical investment, it would be our assessment, um, Chair, that it would take somewhere in the region of £400 million pounds, um, in order to continue to sustain the, the service as it currently is um, and to enable um, schools to operate efficiently and effectively. In terms of radical reform, we are part of the DE transformation um, programme and we are participating in that programme. Um, however, we have, we have been <coughs> undertaking that over the last number of years um, in the absence of being able to make policy change um, and it would be important that that programme was accelerated now in order that some key policy decisions could be made around transformational change. Okay. Can, can you give us some examples of the type of transformations that BEA believe need to happen in order to help this situation? Yes, um, certainly. Well, we, we are involved currently in the DE transformation programme on home to school transport, for example. So, again, we think that's something that there needs to be a key policy decision um, taken forward on the future of home to school transport and the level of provision that is provided in it. We also believe that the 14 to 19 strategy needs to be taken forward and we need to have a radical look um, at our sixth form provision in particular um, and how we work collaboratively cross-departmentally around that area. Um, we also do believe we need to have a fundamental look at the model, the demand and the capacity um, for our early intervention services and how we may invest in those in order to um, uh, not curb the demand, that's the wrong term, but in order to, to, to better manage the demand for those services for children with special educational needs. Okay, I think those are all issues that members will want to ask further questions on and also area planning as well. So uh, let me bring members in at, at this point. Uh, Deputy Chair, Karen Mon, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sarah and Seamus. Um, just would you have outlined there, Seamus, we had um, uh, addressed all of that last week with the department when they were when they were on here as you would know so um it has accepted the financial position that we're in um after many many years of, of austerity um all of us in this room meet and, and discuss with principals who as you have described there shimmis are doing everything that they can and um and they're doing everything they can on paper but they're still not being able to live within their budget they're still going under deficit so um, that, that definitely is now at a stage that needs to be addressed and it has been recognised because the, both governments and all the parties, it is, signed, it is included in the new data document um, for going forward. I suppose what schools would be asking at this stage, and it was something we had put to the department last week, and you know we're in February now moving on the new budgets and all of that. So at this stage has... Um, you know, as there plans in place, um, as the department working with yourselves in terms of plans around being able to make or move towards sustainable, sustainable core budgets, particularly by September 2020, because we're at that stage where we need, we need to be at that, but we also then have to look at the investment, which will probably come on there as we have the discussion um, uh, that is needed in all our areas. I would, I would just sort of pick up on some of the stuff as well, Sarah, around the transformation and caution. You know, 
um, I would be obviously we will work through the work streams, but I'd be very wary and cautious around stripping away. Uh, you know, and uh, some of the stuff comes up at times, and there's not a lot of savings in it. This has to be about the best educational outcomes, the best education service that we can provide. And there needs, there needs to be investment. This shouldn't be just about maybe taking stuff off. So um, whilst you know, there's tra transport does need to be reviewed, you know, I feel it has to be improved as well, as well as early years and the 14 to 19 strategy. So we look forward to working closely with you yourselves on that. And then the last point, just in terms of the special education needs audit, and I know you raised it there in your report, um, and you're saying that it's going to, there's going to be an improvement team. Um, but I believe that we need to see side of that. I have a timeline here that I have been in contact with, with yourselves from March last year. So for 11 months now in relation to some uh, of the issues and concerns we had been raising. I understand um, it's probably complex and within, but I do believe that at some stage we need to know a timeline of when we're going to see that and when we're going to get an update on it. Do you want to respond? Okay. Um, yes, um, Karen, absolutely. Um, it would be appropriate that you would see that. Um, it just won't be at this point in time, but I will provide you, will provide the committee with an update as to when it can come forward. So when, when did the, uh, <coughs> the Education Authority audit of SEN administration commence, Sarah? September. Okay. And do you have uh, an expected date for completion? It, it is completed and the yes. recommendations are with me. Okay. So it would be a timeline in order to share it with the committee, Chair, which I will come back to the committee with. So you don't, don't have a proposed date at this moment in time for when the recommendations will be available to the committee? No. No. Okay. That's something you can provide to us and yeah. as soon as possible then. Okay. Um, Karen, content for now? Just yeah. really on the, the sustainable core school budgets, have we any idea of how you know, any information from the department in terms of when schools are likely to see that um, increase that they, that they need? Well, um, the, the planning phase for the forthcoming financial year has started already within the Education Authority. Um, I guess the, the starting point for that has to be validation of the census data that has been received from schools because uh, members may be aware the funding that schools receive is based on the common funding scheme and particularly the common funding formula. And the common funding formula has a number of um, factors or criteria that determine the funding to each individual school. It's, it's largely based on um, <coughs> pupil numbers, but it's adjusted for targeting social needs, premises size, uh, split site and a range of other factors. So that's quite a substantial exercise. That information has been submitted by the schools. It has been subjected to review already by the department's statistical team and it has come back to the education authority for validation, for example, against our free school means database. So that work has recently completed. That will now allow the department to move forward with the original or initial indicative budgets for schools. Yeah. And that really then uh, begins a process where we meet with the, the 1,000 schools to look at what their plans are for the next three years. I guess what, what I should say is that um, we, we understand that however efficient the schools might manage to be over the next three years in comparison with their colleagues and however uh, efficient we can be with the, the resources that we have to support schools, I think the reality is that we simply do not have enough money. But nonetheless, I believe it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate that we are making the best use of what we've got. So I guess to answer your question, um, we have uh, looked at the financial position going forward. Um, as the financial director, I don't believe that um, the position is, um, I guess, fixable within one financial year. Um, I think it needs a more holistic review of the model of service delivery and as Sarah mentioned the, the capacity and the demand against that. Fundamentally, um, Karen, it, it will probably need some decisions at government level around what the Northern Ireland public sector wants to spend its money on and I, I understand that those are difficult decisions. So I guess we have I've been working closely with the department around the three to five year plan for uh, 
uh, bring in schools and the sector onto a stable and uh, sustainable financial footing. That work will kick off in earnest. It will tie in with the policy discussions and the policy reviews that are already ongoing. Um, you will be aware that decisions and um, evidence-based analysis of that nature will take quite a bit of time. So we will do what we can in the current financial year. We will continue to work with the department and lobby for some more resource. We believe that we will need some bridging funding to sustain schools during the period um, within which we carry out that important analysis. And uh, I have no doubt that we will have many more conversations with ourselves about what that looks like and what <coughs> that means. Oh, thank you, Jim. As I understand, like in terms of until the budget is set and we find out, you know, even for ourselves, going through this process over the next couple of weeks. But um, you know, it's a question that obviously schools is asking us all, and it's just to hear the plan. So thank you very much for that update. Thank you, Chair. Okay, that was your uh, William Humphrey. Thanks, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. Just before I ask the question, in terms of the papers that have been um, presented to us. Um, can I just ask, um, the Education Committee has made available a draft incomplete and unaudited copy of its 2018-19 annual report and accounts. <coughs> Why is that uh, incomplete and unaudited at this stage? Um, I, I guess the, 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 the position now is that um, the audit has recently completed. It came through our Audit and Risk Assurance Committee in January. Um, the accounts have been endorsed and came through our board meeting um, in the beginning of February. So we are waiting imminently for the uh, Northern Ireland Order Office to um, certify the accounts. Um, I, I guess there has been no delay at the Education Authority um, side. This is the, uh, the timeline that is established and set out by the Northern Ireland Order Office, and we have complied with that fully. Right, so this is the norm then? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just to update, um, there is a, a process underway to, I guess, ensure that there is faster closing of accounts moving into the future, and we are working with the audit office around that timeline. But at this point, um, that's a timeline that has been set by the audit office for the audit and certification, and we are in compliance with that at this point. I imagine if this was, uh, if the audit was um, completed earlier. Uh, then you, it would help you in terms of your, your, your work for the incoming year and years, as, as you've said out earlier. Okay, thanks. Um, can I just ask, in terms of the transportation, Sarah, you, you mentioned that you um, moved 90,000 young people a day to, to school. Um, I did ask the question last week, in terms of your fleet, mm -hmm. um, is it the case that the Education Authority buys the vehicles? and therefore pays for the maintenance of those vehicles. Uh, and if that is the case, which I think it was confirmed to this committee last week, that that is the case, um, has the authority looked at the possibility of leasing vehicles uh, as well in terms of um, providing efficiencies? I'll, I'll pick that up, Chair. Um, yes, firstly, at the moment, all of our vehicles are purchased. Mm -hmm. um, we, run, we run a fleet of 825 buses. Um, we currently have submitted, we recently submitted in the past few days a business case to the value of circa 50 million for the replacement of those vehicles and one of the options explored within that business case is, is the potential to, to lease vehicles. Um, the leasing of vehicles though is a recurrent cost so um, presently within that business case the preferred option is to continue to purchase vehicles. But it, the 50 million won't, won't replace your entire fleet presumably you rep so you, that's recurring as well? Yes, absolutely. And I do think that's something which should be looked at. In terms of the, the um, sorry, you mentioned the, the use of school buildings and facilities. Given the, the current financial um, position that the state finds itself in, um, in terms of uh, money being tight, uh, I think it's important that um, regional government, local government, universities, private clubs, uh, and so on, sweat the assets that are there in terms of facilities, whether they be buildings or whether they be pitches. Can I ask what work you've been doing and what work you intend to do, working, for example, with local government and councils to do just that? We have, um, uh, William, we have done uh, significant work across um, all of the local council areas in 
terms of making sure that any of the assets that we are using can be joint or shared assets, but maybe I'll ask him um, to pick up a bit more on that in the community use of schools and the shared education programmes as yeah. well. So, so we have a statutory duty to um, facilitate community use of schools. So we look at how we can open schools with existing pitches to the community, but also then we are working with councils to look at if a, new, if a school needs a new pitch and the council needs sports facilities, how we can then work together. So there are some examples of how we have managed to do that. We're also uh, statutory partners across the 11 um, community planning um, partnerships. And so within that, we also talk to our statutory partners and to the councils in terms of how we can make the best use of our facilities and schools. Can, can I just say in terms of uh, local kind of my local council, which would be Belfast City Council, I mean, I've made that point to the chief executive and directors there as well. It's just hugely important for the taxpayer and ratepayer because mm -hmm. they are the same people. Uh, at the end of the day, we can get a efficiencies and economies of scale you know, and, and not everyone have their own um, estate of pitches or, or, or buildings, but actually get a, a joint up use uh, and whatever, when they cease being school buildings at whatever time of the day they've been come for the use of the, of the wider general public. Could I just in terms of area planning, then finally ask a question. Um, in terms of the, the and I can only speak of my own area, in terms of area planning, it doesn't happen quickly enough. And that then means that um, the investment in schools, replacement, redevelopment, refurbishment of schools, uh, for example, an area plan for primary school education in Greater Shankill uh, has been talked about for some time and nothing done. Um, we have schools, and I mentioned last week Glenwood, sorry, you've been to Glenwood mm -hmm. with me yeah. uh, and, and seen the condition and the state of the building. Um, and I, you know, I, I think there needs to be more progression in those things. Um, to speed up the area planning because it's hugely frustrating and difficult for teachers to in, in some of the, the, the buildings and members of all have, have expressed views in this uh, at our meeting last week. And so in our constituencies, you know, they're doing a great job, some of them in conditions that are simply not fit for purpose any longer. Can I just ask that some impetus be put into the area plan to allow you that uh, redevelopment or replacement to happen? Yep, thank you, absolutely. Um, one of the issues with area planning is the idea that we need to plan for an area and not for individual schools. And we need to ensure that the community are working with us and have an opportunity to have their say in terms of what their schooling um, should look like. And all of that absolutely does take time. And so we're trying to balance the needs and wants of the community and the school buildings, but ultimately what is in the best interest educationally for the children. So it is absolutely time consuming. And what we have endeavoured to do within this strategic plan is to ensure that all our sectoral partners work together with us to agree what is in the best interest of children for a particular area. And so that is time consuming as well. But just to give you assurances that we're aware of some of the frustrations of around the time scales and that we work very, very, you know, alongside our partners to try to, to improve the timing where we can. So we'll continue to do that as we move through uh, this current strategy. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, the area planning uh, review is currently underway and one of the areas that we will be looking at in that review is the time scales that an area plan to, you know that the process takes. So, Unless the review doesn't belong at time scales. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the other thing, William, um, to add to that is that we fully <coughs> recognise that um, the need to um, plan the capital programme alongside the area planning process itself and to better join those two processes up so that actually um, what you described doesn't take place and actually um, the, the capital the capital development associated with area planning can be in place. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rob Newton. Yeah, Chair, just before I go to my own question and pick up on an aspect of Williams, um, uh, Elm Grove off and Neil has been a bit of a disaster, hasn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm not in a position to talk about individual um, schools at the moment, but I can certainly come, come back to you with information on any individual schools that you, that you wish to afterwards. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chair. I'm sure you would as well. Yeah, I mean, as we've obviously mentioned previously, um, we endeavour to keep our specific cases channeled through specific means, but, um, yeah, that it, obviously the... Uh, 
area planning amalgamation in relation to those two schools is extremely important to us as constituency MLAs and I'm, I'm sure we'd, we'd be keen to, to hear an update in relation to that particular process. Um, it is, uh, as yourself and William have alluded to, Robin, in, indicative of some of the wider challenges in relation to area planning um, and we'd be keen to hear more about that but happy to bring you back in at that point, Robin, obviously. I'll leave that one, Chair, until um, maybe you can come come back to us on that. I would, I would, Chair, and I think uh, I think we all realise, um, you know, the, the the significance of the and the wide, very wide brief of the Education uh, Authority, and I, I'm sure you would be intending on this, Chair, to bring uh, perhaps aspects of it back to the table as we yeah. move uh, through the next uh, number of months. Well, I do thank uh, Sarah and our team uh, for, for coming along today. Um, I, I would be, I mean, we often talk about the cost of education. I prefer to talk about investment uh, in education. Uh, I mean, and I think it's, 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 I think it's been said widely before, but, you know, the importance of education in terms of our individual members of society, our families, our communities, the economy, uh, just society as a whole, and the importance of it as a, uh, as a bedrock for, for everything uh, that, that, that uh, uh, comprises uh, society. Um, and I would want to, to, to ask, uh, just I think it's a relatively simple question, Chair. Relatively simple questions do tend to become very complex at, at the end of the day. But we formed uh, the Education Authority to provide savings um, as, uh, that would release money uh, to, uh, for direct education. And as uh, Mr. Wade has said, you know, the, the, the budget is spent on the, it's a payroll uh, budget. So really, in terms of the amalgamation of the Education and Library Boards into uh, the Education Authority, there were a number of projected savings. What are the actual savings on an annual basis? I, there are not many of us here who were part of the amalgamation of the five Education and Library Boards. Um, and it was some time ago. We do have the, the original business case um, for that, and we will be able to provide you with that information. But it's not something we have with us here today. That's disappointing, Chair, that that wouldn't be a figure that was mm -hmm. uh, sort of just immediately put on the table at any time stage. Of we have made £100 million worth of savings since um, our commencement, as I did outline in our presentation. But in terms of what that meant versus the previous running costs, that I don't know. Uh, sorry, can you just run that figure of £100 million past me again? Yes. How, how is that comprised then? So um, there were a number of um, areas, but effectively um, we, we sought to protect schools from the um, the impact of this. Um, one of the so a, few, a few things we have done is we have reduced our um, staff and numbers. Um, we have tried to cut back on costs wherever that's been possible um, from the, the central budgets that we hold to support schools. Um, we have also um, sought to make the best use of uh, the funds from an accounting perspective in that we have um, worked with schools to ensure that any stock of consumables or equipment that haven't been capitalised at school level um, are accounted for. And the first year in which schools count that stock, that qualifies as effectively a reduction in expenditure. So um, those are the main areas that we have used to try and uh, reduce the cost. And that has amounted to a hundred millions of savings since the formation of the Education Authority? Yes. But we don't know today what the savings have been on the formation of the Education Authority vis-a-vis -vis the five yeah. Education and Library Board. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Might be useful if we... 
establish that. Established. Yeah, I, I agree. Members are content. Um, okay. We, if if it's possible to give us more detailed information in that <coughs> regards, and or perhaps we can raise that direct with the minister and the department again. It, it is a critical question um, to assess whether the aims of the establishment of the Education Authority have been achieved. Um, Robin, do you want to ask any other questions at this stage? or? Uh, well, I think, uh, Chair, if, if, if we can establish that, then it might lead to, at a later date, some, some other questions. But I would look forward to, Chair, and you've already agreed that you know this will be a, obviously an yep. ongoing uh, discussion. And if, Perhaps aspects yep. uh, will delve th a bit deeper into I think things. area planning is a prime example of one of those particular cases that we'd like to have a more detailed session in relation to, and that is scheduled in our forward work programme. Indeed, I have a couple of other questions I would ask in relation to it, but keen to bring other members in at this point, and we'd invite Robbie Butler to ask mm -hmm. questions. My apologies for having to leave the room. It wasn't you, it was me. <laughs> um, okay, and forgive me, Chair, if, if these questions have been asked in my absence. I'll keep you right. Go okay, ahead. Good. Okay, so the first uh, question will relate to Workstream 2 in area planning. Um, you did allude to that you're working with SIB to complete the review. Um, I'd like to ask how much or what level of engagement um, at a local area with head teachers on a collegiate approach, not individually, but on a collegiate approach, um, has uh, happened. Obviously, focused on uh, uh, people focused, and uh, if there is a mechanism for that, and how it's been captured. Yep. Um, thank you. So, as part of the review, yes, as Sarah had outlined, we are engaging with our school leaders. So, we ran three educational leadership conferences um, prior to Christmas, where one of the workshops from the conferences was specifically around engaging with school leaders on the area planning review. So, we sent out to all school leaders to invite them <coughs> to come along to that. And then we ran three workshops across three of our main localities um, in the EA, where we collectively then worked through some of the issues that school leaders were presenting to us in terms of the area planning experiences that they had, both with the, the overall strategy, the sustainable schools policy, but also then as part of their own experiences of going through area planning. So that has been captured across those three conferences. Okay, and um, to finish that one out, uh, in terms of the parental voice then, um, has that been captured? Is that captured through the same forum, through the school leaders, or is there a... There, ha there hasn't been a separate forum for capturing the parental voice. However, when the school leaders have talked to us, they have talked about their experiences in terms of the whole process, including the consultation processes that we have with parents in the schools as we go through the area planning process. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, yeah, okay. So, uh, on works team three then. Um, so, I'm just, uh, I was interested to read about the, the use of digital technology for admissions. Okay, so I'm just <coughs> question would be in terms of perhaps simplifying the statementing process or even the review process, has there been any investigations into how you might use technology? Because there's a substantial bill, I think six million pounds a year for the, the review. Um, statementing takes up a significant part of the budget, and a lot of that will come down to um, handling queries from elected representatives or parents or teachers. Obviously, there's, a, there's a, the human resource issue in terms of the, the people. So has there been any um, work done in, in technology in terms of how we could uh, make better use of that? And yeah. there's a number of benefits sorry, for it in terms of openness, transparency, and the ease of submitting evidence. Uh, yes, there has been work done on that. And actually, we've received funding from um, the SBRI um, in order to progress that piece of work. So it's in its um, early, early um, infancy, um, but that piece of work is being progressed through that, that funding stream from SBRI. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say what SBRI is. Well, business, business Research, research Initiative. initiative. Yeah. No, thank you. <coughs> and, and final question, if that's okay, Chair. Mm. Um, again, I'm, I'm just going to go back to um, the parental voice. So in terms of the, the statementing process and the issues that we, we face, and I know that there's a review, ongoing. Uh, how are parental voices captured in terms of any um, process going forward that will be developed? Um, one of the, the early discussions that we've had at this point is that we would become involved in the local government association's peer review process and key and integral to that is the parental voice and that would involve um, a very focused and structured way to capture um, a large number of parental voices. At this point in time, we rely on our own existing forums, our feedback, our complaints mechanisms um, and our meetings with stakeholder groups but that would become a much more structured way forward as part of that peer review.
Is there any sort of a timeline in terms of where that would fit in? Um, April to June time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Okay, thanks, Rob. Can I can I ask where the how the voice of the the child and young person is included in these processes as well? Yes, again, there are a range um, of, of forums and, and mechanisms through which we do that. Um, it's probably not a single structured um, voice of the child at this point in that we don't have a young person's forum or a particular young person's committee, but it is something that we'll, we will be taking forward as part of that piece of work as well, Chair. Okay. Um, in, ter in terms of special educational needs, then, um, and bring other members in on other questions in a moment here, but the, how, what is the, the statutory period for uh, a SEN assessment to be conducted and for a statement to be provided? 26 weeks. Okay. And what, what, what currently is the amount of, is the percentage of um, applications, assessments that are beyond that 26 weeks? That, that's actually something we're, <coughs> excuse me, that's something we're working through at the minute. We are aware that there are a significant number of statements that are not being progressed within the 26 weeks. Um, and at this point in time, what we are doing is we are actually working through those who are over and above the 26 weeks um, to understand what the, what the level of that, um, that gap is and how we are going to take that forward to, um, to shorten <coughs> the gap for those who are currently in the system who are outside of the 26 weeks, but also how we can put preventative measures in and be more efficient in terms of the statement process going forward. Okay. Well, and we'd welcome that and expect that. Uh, what, what, do you have a rough idea of the percentage of, of assessments that go beyond the 26-week time limit? Yes, there, there's a high proportion of the of this statements go beyond the process. Um, there are a number of reasons for that, and there is also the ability to apply a, a valid exemption to the statementing process, and that's part of the piece of work that we want to do as well, to understand how... While there may be a valid exemption applied, how can we shorten the period of that exemption as well, so that um, we have a look at it in a, in a more holistic way? Okay. Um, what what would that high percentage be? What, approximately how many? It's difficult for us to um, assess at this stage because of some of the systems that we have in place, um, and also because of the use of the valid exemptions. Um, so. I wouldn't like to give you a figure here today, but again, certainly um, Karen's talked about um, information that needs to come back to the committee and it will form part of that. Do you, do you know the percentage of applications that are beyond the 26 weeks? Not specifically or not to the... To the um, it's somewhere in the region of 80%. Okay. And how concerned by the extent of that percentage is the Education Authority? Extremely. Okay. Uh, have you managed to establish any reasons or causes as to why such a concerning percentage of, state of assessments are taking longer than the statutory aim? Well, that's exactly the piece of work that we're doing now, um, and that's exactly the piece of work that when I referred to the improvement team that have been um, put in place that they will be working with staff um, to do, which is to understand where the delays in the process are, why the delays in the process are taking place, where there are valid exemptions, can they be in any way shortened and reduced, even if they are valid, um, and how do we make the process run in a much more streamlined way. Okay. Um, what is the time scale for the outcome of that review? Um, the review is complete, as I've said, so this is the improvement team at this point in time. Okay. It's about them making immediate changes where we can, and then to bring back to you some of those more um, short to medium term changes around that process. Okay. And do you have a, an idea in terms of when the, the improvement team would be able to report to the committee on that work? Yes. Within, I would say, within the next number of months. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll seek clarity in relation to that. Robbie, do you want to ask a supplementary in relation uh, to this matter? Yeah, if okay. Yep, yep. Um, I, I, there was just uh, the, the £6 million for the annual review caught my eye with regard to this conversation. Then, Is it possible that that is part of the blockage and part of the. There's, there's something in the mechanism in terms of the annual review which isn't value, maybe hindering the ability to deal with the 26 and, 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 and apply that? Is, is that something that's going to be picked up in the review? 
It will be picked up, yes, absolutely. It will be picked up in terms of the number of deadlines that our staff have to meet um, so that they are, you know, that, that they are constantly um, having to meet a range of numerous deadlines and that perhaps that could be more systematically applied um, in terms of what we do. So it will certainly form part of that, but I don't have a, I haven't formed a view on that yet, but it will form part of the analysis. Okay. Uh, to, to follow on then, uh, in terms of the, the delays experienced, what, what is the impact of this high percentage uh, of assessment going beyond the statutory aim for children and young people with potential special educational needs? And obviously, early intervention is set as a, a key aim in relation to special educational needs. What, what can you give us an idea of the, the level and type of impact that this is likely to be having on? early intervention and educational outcomes for children and young people with potential special educational needs? I think it's fair to say that late intervention is going to have an impact on the outcome for children, their, learn, their experience in school and the pressures that it puts on families. Um, there's a lot of stress associated with this. Um, the impact, I think, is, is, is felt by teachers in the classrooms as well. Um, and they're, they're clearly telling us that, that we need to be more efficient um, in, in how we get this process completed and that's very much um, the work that is ongoing and, 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 and the objective of that is to try and to, to, to improve um, the experience of children um, and, and the whole class. Yep, okay. I, I think it is important to <coughs> acknowledge the impact on teachers as well as MLAs. I think we are frequently contacted about the lack of access to support and particularly with regards to educational psychology and the extremely small amount of sessions available um, for schools um, to access educational I psychology. Suppose, Chair, maybe just to say, responded to as well? I suppose to say that that is why this, we believe this piece of work is so important. It's not for the, the process of running the administrative process in its own right. It's what the delays in that process mean for the impact on children. So that is absolutely why it is of such concern to us and absolutely why it is so important to us. Um, because it isn't, it isn't the process itself or the process in its own right, but it is that impact that it has um, on children. Okay. And in terms of the proposed new special educational needs framework, um, what, what has education authority or will be education authorities input into what that new framework will look like? Well, we have been working closely with our colleagues in DE um, on that, and we have provided our commentary and been involved closely with DE in, in moving that forward. Okay, and also, obviously, there was a, a consultation with regards to the early years special educational needs framework, which included issues that our predecessor committee had taken a strong interest in with regards to potential reductions to special education and need nursery hours. Um, is there a time scale for when the committee might receive a, an analysis of the consultation responses you received to that uh, process or indeed a time scale for introduction of the new early years framework? Um, certainly, Chair, we can, we can have a report back to the committee um, within, your, within your work programme if that's helpful. When, we'll when did the on consultation that. on the earlier SEND framework close? I don't know. Okay. Well, I, I, my recollection is it was quite some time ago, so I, I think a, a, a timely uh, re report on the analysis of that consultation report would be appreciated by the committee. Okay. Um, okay. One other issue in terms of special educational needs. Um, Obviously, the Education Authority was considering uh, a new model of delivery for special schools um, across Northern Ireland, and I think that was responded to perhaps most acutely in, in Belfast. Is there any update in relation to that matter? Uh, if I can just maybe pick that up. So the area planning um, portfolio for special schools is now sitting temporarily within the Education Directorate. Uh, so I am picking up how we're going to move that forward and how we're going to accelerate uh, those processes. I have been in touch with some of the principals from those schools already, um, those special schools in Belfast, to look at how we can hopefully begin that process within the, next, within the coming weeks uh, to move it forward. And I think the Education Authority had initiated enhanced consultation with parents in relation to that process. Is that ongoing? 
that process is, to my knowledge, has begun, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure in terms of the detail around how much of that has, ha has started, but, but I will be looking at that as part of moving the whole agenda forward. Okay. What well, last issue, and I'll bring other members in terms of special educational needs. Um, I imagine the Education Authority will be aware of a few um, extremely concerning instances of the inappropriate use of seclusion and restraint, and is perhaps aware of uh, Scotland's move to introduce new legislative guidelines in relation to the appropriate use of seclusion and restraint. Um, can the Education Authority update the committee in relation to your work on that matter? Yes, but it, we have been working with um, colleagues in the Department of Education looking at this as a policy issue. Um, and it is an important area that is, uh, is been taken, taken very seriously, um, particularly for those children who are, who are vulnerable in terms of, of, of their mobility. And do you think new legislative guidelines are necessary and will be introduced in Northern Ireland? I think there should be a policy um, and guidance for staff um, in relation to the use of restraint. Okay, well, that, that's certainly something that we'll, we'll follow up with you as well on that matter. Can I, can I bring Justin McNulty in? Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. You're all very welcome. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Um, and thank you for engaging with me so positively over the last number of years when this place was closed and being so helpful on, on so many fronts. Um, inspire, support, challenge all children and young people to be the best they can be. That's a very, very uh, positive vision and your strategic priorities. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a bit of a helicopter view here and then I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive. In terms of your, st your strategic priorities, meeting the learning needs of our children and young people, providing excellent educational support services, developing all our, our people to carry out their jobs successfully, managing our resources effectively and efficiently, nurturing leadership across the Education Authority to give clear direction in a dynamic and complex environment. I love your vision, I love your strategic priorities. To what extent are you being enabled and supporting in achieving your strategic priorities in terms of funding? In terms of funding, I think having outlined the challenges um, earlier, I think it's probably one of the single biggest constraints that we have in being able to fully um, achieve um, all the vision that we set out for ourselves. Um, I would say that doesn't mean that it isn't what drives us every day in terms of the services that we provide and what we do and how we deliver those services. But we recognise that in a constrained and challenging financial environment, our ability to fully achieve them um, all the time is somewhat curtailed. And to what extent or what, what has been the impact of this place being closed for three years on your ability to um, meet your strategic priorities? and on the morale of your teachers and teams? Well, I think um, we have continued over the last three years to drive forward as best we can all of the reform or changes um, that are required. Um, as I said at the outset, there are key policy decisions we would like to see taken forward now, and we would welcome those being taken forward that would support us. Um, they wouldn't in their own selves, I think, deliver all of our priorities, but they would certainly support us in doing that. Okay, thank you. In terms of SEN, I know there's been a lot of discussion already on SEN. And I appreciate the, the challenge that SEN um, provides for you in terms of the numbers presenting with special education needs, you know, numbers of children. Is that partially, is that something that maybe is, should be possibly celebrated in that education has been so much more bespoke and individual child oriented instead of one monogamous group which was in, in all of our times it was just we were all the same is that something to be celebrated that the education is, is actually more focused on an individual child specifically <coughs> and i know that that places an extraordinary burden on the system in terms of teaching staff and on children and on parents but is that something that maybe should be potentially celebrated that we are being much more child specific yes yeah. yes do you want to? Well, I mean, absolutely. You know, everything we, we do within the Education Authority, we have put the child at the centre of what we do, and that is absolutely how, how we move forward with everything, uh, whether it be the special educational needs provision or whether it be looking at gifted and talented or looking at how we can improve educational outcomes in school. So it's something that we strive to do with everything every day. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. In terms of key stage one, um, percentage of pupils achieving the expected level, just explain to me why the trend seems to have been downwards across all so, so half English and each of each of um, the key stages in terms of assessment um, assessment has been severely impacted by the action short of strike which is currently existing across all of our schools so the return around the key stage assessments in DSEA has been very low and so the figures have had to be adjusted to take account of the impact of the low return rates um, so I think everybody in the system would agree that until we get a more robust way of assessing at each key stage so that the system can actually understand the progress of children um, across literacy, um, across um, you know, communication using MAS and ICT, that um, those figures you know, are questionable in terms of how our children are progressing. So it is, I mean, we are in a difficult period that we're not across what each of those key stage assessments look like right across all of our schools as they currently, as they currently sit. No, that's really, so explain to me why the trend is downward. So the trend, the, the number of schools that are submitting um, is very, very low. And so we need to take a look at the fact that we aren't, we don't understand what the level is across those three areas, across all of our schools, because schools are not submitting their levels into SEA. So, so yes, those figures, you know, on the face of it will look as if there's a slight decrease, but actually we need to take account of the fact that there's only been a small sample size that has been returned. Now, I'm not saying that that may not be then indicative of what the system is. What I am saying is at the moment as we stand, we are not able to give a good enough assessment as to the progress of our children at each key stage because of where we are with our assessment issue. Okay. Thank you very much. And hi. Hi. That perhaps that is a timely opportunity to ask <coughs> how urgent it is for the fair pay and conditions to be <coughs> delivered and agreed. Would you like an opportunity to speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, as I said um, at the outset, um, we have an opportunity now. We have a, an agreed deal between management side and trade union side. We are no longer in negotiation. We, we have an agreed pay deal, and it is not just a pay deal. There are a number of work streams associated with that that really will enable us to take forward actually quite transformative things across the education sector. We, have, we are working closely with trade union side at the moment around the development of a transition plan um, from how we move from the current state to the new state and we are also working hard on what those work streams might look like and what we can expect from them in terms of work stream preparatoriness. I, I mean I believe we have a window of opportunity here and I think it would be it would be awful if we lost that opportunity um, and I'm not sure how we would gain the ground back again if we did. Have you had any indication from executive ministers with regards to progress on <coughs> securing the finance to deliver that so no, no recent update um, um you probably had the more recent update um than we did what, what we do know is the business case is with the department of finance <coughs> is there um but we have no update on on anything further okay um Car Deputy Chair, do you want to come back in on a few yeah. items? Catherine? Uh, Catherine? Yeah, Catherine, no problem. Um, thank you for your briefing um, and for answering our questions this morning. Um, this is, my question is in relation, my first question is in relation to communication. Um, and I think this is something that we have raised before. Um, but it's still the case that us as MLAs and our office staff um, are having to contact senior management directly. With an EA, whenever you know, in relation to um, special educational needs issues, um, and this doesn't happen with any other department. Um, yes, Karen has raised that with me um, in the past, and certainly, as I said, um, one of my first day one commitments were around our communication and enhancing and improving our communications. So that's something that we are committed to doing, um, and we do have a number of pieces of work on ongoing with that. So, I mean, certainly that specific issue. Um, um, we will um, look into. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's also fair to say that in terms of the process that we're taking forward in relation to improvement, we also need to look at how we communicate with, with children, with, fa you know, with families and with others um, who are interested parties. 
Thank you. And also, um, just in relation to the education support for resettling Syrian refugees, I know in the area that, that I live, um, in West Throne and Oma, um, a local school, Christ the King, um, there are a lot of children um, who have moved from Syria and are availing of the support programme that's in place. I'm just wondering, is there an, does anyone have an update on how that is across the north? Um, is it is it working? Is it is yeah, it effective? We, we have an intercultural <coughs> education service who takes responsibility for supporting schools um, for newcomers, for travellers, and for those um, Syrian refugees. Um, they work as part of an interagency process, so they're working together with with colleagues in in working in health and in housing and in in, in other areas to support families um, settle. Um, we're certainly happy to get you more information on that, but our sense is, in the main, it's working. You know, it, it's working well, um, and children coming from newcomer children are actually doing well in our schools in terms of their their educational attainment. Um, it's obviously dependent on the on the support that they get within the school and within their communities. Also, <coughs> um, we are aware that some of the, some families then move to, to other locations. So when they're originally settled in the likes of, of say, Straban or Oma or other areas, that they, particularly if they have children with medical issues, that they, they tend to, to move towards the Belfast, the Belfast area where the regional <coughs> hospital is. But there is, there is, I feel, you know, there are supports have been put in place to support, <coughs> support the families and it's, it's, it's working well, as I understand. Thank you. Okay, Catherine. Um, William Humphrey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Debbie Chair, do you want to come back in on yeah. another matter? Yeah, afterwards. no problem. William. Um, thanks very much. Just on the, the, the um, issue of communication, um, I have met with the North Belfast and British Angle Principles Group. You will be aware, perhaps, of the frustration that principals have in terms of the relationship with the EA and getting information from the EA, getting a response, uh, effective, effective response um, on a decent timeline. Can I ask what steps you're taking to, to address that, or uh, indeed if you share that view? Um, I can probably take that uh, question, Chair. So we have developed a customer charter. At the end of the day, we're a service delivery organisation and the relationships with school leaders um, in, in this respect, they are our customers and we need to ensure that we're responding to them in a timely manner and they know what the next steps are and they can understand the services that we have and who to contact um, easily. So we've developed a customer charter which sets out expectations um, for our staff in terms of timeliness of responding to phone calls and emails. Um, it sets out what customers can expect from our services, the behaviours that they can expect from the people that they deal with. And it also does look at what is helpful for us to gain from whoever those customers are so that we can answer the query or deal with the issue effectively and efficiently in a timely fashion. So from the start of January until <coughs> April, we have been um, training our uh, office-based staff across our five offices um, on uh, that customer charter and the expectations through a specific customer, I suppose, service training initiative. And we hope, therefore, that the, the commitments that the charter makes, we can share that externally from April onwards. Um, that's something that we've developed in conjunction with school leaders and very much based on their feedback. And last year we conducted a survey with school leaders about how we can communicate better and we have a range of other work streams that are underway to improve communication in a whole variety of channels as well. So is this customer charter just <coughs> established in January of this year? Uh, we've been sharing it with our staff from January mm. so that we can be very clear about these are the standards that we expect how quickly phone calls should be responded to, time scales for emails and the types of behaviour. So yes, so and we're training those staff now. So it's too early to know whether the, the service has improved. When will you review that? Um, we hope to have some bench line, uh, baseline information. So we do obviously monitor complaints and feedback that we get. So that gives us a bit of a baseline. But we, we will be doing that um, ongoing through normal management arrangements. Okay. And we hope that our colleagues hold each other accountable as well for meeting those standards. 
we, we as a committee have uh, members have all articulated our concerns in terms of mental health, suicide awareness, general well-being uh, of young people. And I mean, it, it's my view there needs to be a greater joint upness across government, between government departments, the EA, um, you know, arm's length bodies like the public health authority, councils, and so on. What can the EEA do more to help to address these huge issues within um, schools? And I mean, I've spoken to principals who are who are having to use frontline money. It's for educational provision, and when you when you when you distill it all down, the amount of money that the principals have to actually spend uh, in schools on books or equipment, whatever, becomes very small in the context of a huge, huge school and a huge budget. And some of that then, when it is used to, to buy in professional services for counsellors and whatever, reduces that further and reduces the, therefore, the, the frontline delivery in terms of education. So what more can be done? I think certainly we're, we're very conscious of the increase in demand in relation to our young people's mental health. Um, what we, I think we need to approach it on a number of different levels. <coughs> First, uh, firstly, there is the universal level. So what are we doing for children, for all children in schools so that they learn to, to, to actually look after their own mental health from very early stages, and that is where early intervention or prevention needs, needs to happen. Um, so there's work needs to go on there. Certainly, the nurture program, program that is um, that has been piloted at the minute in terms of how we actually support schools to embed the nurture principles in, into primary schools is an important one that we want to, we would like to take forward. Um, we also need to look at those groups of children who have particular needs and how we target interventions at those at, um, for for those children. Um, so we have groups of children who have social emotional behavioural issues. Um, a lot of that, and whilst we try to manage behaviour, we need to understand their behaviour. So we're working with the Safeguarding Board um, as key members of the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland, looking at trauma-informed practice um, initiatives and how we can understand children better to support their, their need. Um, and that's about noticing when a child is in distress and intervening early, um, as opposed to necessarily managing them, suspending them, um, and, and, and some of the, the, the reactions maybe that we have when we don't, we don't have that level of understanding that we need. And then we have services such as the CERT service, that's our critical incident support service when there's critical incidents, so that there is a team available to support schools um, to help them through what can be very challenging times um, in relation to incidents such as, as um, pupil death, and including by suicide or parental suicide or serious um, issues. But is there sufficient joint upness? I would like to see more joint upness. I think we, there's opportunities to work with with our colleagues, particularly in, in health. In terms of the trauma informed practice, it is the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland that has been given mm. that um, given that lead lead role. Um, I think we obviously need to work, and we do work with the public health agency. Um, a lot, you know, a lot with ourselves, but I think there's more opportunities to do that. But again, it's about it's about time, it's about resource, um, and it's about making sure that we have the structures in place that allow us to do Sounds that. Yep, yeah, I accept that. My point is, <coughs> if everyone around the table brings their their shared experience, knowledge, mm. and resource, yes, and efficiencies may well be be achieved. You know, not that we should be looking at efficiencies, efficiencies in this area, but if, if people will combine their resource. In terms of people, experience, and money, yes. and perhaps we make a more effective outcome. We would, we would you? support that, William. And I think it would be fair for me to say that um, Arlene Key has just joined us in the public gallery, and we'll be speaking with you later about our youth service and the key role that they play in this as well. And I think you'll hear more from Arlene about that as well. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. I just want to come back on um, the. Uh, discussion we had there around statements and statements and to say I know we're all extremely concerned um, and we've had this conversation myself and, and some yourself Sarah and others within your team um, and so is the Children's Commissioner and the Children's Law Centre um, and they have been very very vocal on it and I'd like to see yourselves working closer with them and as I've said uh, I've informed you before even within my own team my office manager has, has we've had training through the Children's Law Centre now on a number of occasions to be able to support, provide that support to parents. So we, it's it's 
taking too length of a time, but my question in relation to that is I'm looking for detail. If they can provide the committee with a detailed list of young people who have a statement who are on a reduced timetable, time if we can get that information. I've asked for some of this information in the past and we haven't got it, but maybe now that we're in the committee we can, we can get that. Because it is alarming that we, we, we don't have the figures here today of um, the numbers of statements and the delays. Um, but I, I know from listening to the Children's Law Centre and that they, they would have them. So if I could get that, I would appreciate it. Um, Sarah, just on procurement, um, there was the review, the strategic review was carried out. Has that been concluded? Um, I, I can pick that up, Karen. So we're, we're very close to, to finishing that. Um, we had a number of recommendations and a number of actions to complete against that. So I actually have a meeting this week to discuss the timeline for getting reaccreditation. So we're anticipating probably um, May, June time to go for reaccreditation, for co reaccreditation. And then I'm not sure if it's yourself, Dale, but I sent you an email yesterday requesting a meeting. <laughs> um, this has just come to my attention over the last number of weeks around the changes to work experience arrangements. Now, I haven't got my head all around it, but I, I would appreciate a meeting and it may be something that the committee might pick up. But um, whilst I welcome the, uh, the improvements and ensure that people and safety, employee safety comes first, um, I suppose, firstly, I want that they asked, you know, how, why have these new, new arrangements come about? Would you? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'll pick up on this. <coughs> so previously, within the five education and library boards, schools had to submit a lot of paperwork into the boards. We had to sign off to say, yes, we agree where the young person is going to go on placement. That then went back into the school, and then the young person was allowed to go on to the placement. So it was very bureaucratic. It was very, very time intensive in terms of our officers and actually it was taking away the autonomy from the schools to make their decisions as to where the young people should go and work experience. So it was absolutely right that we reviewed our guidance around work experience so that schools were able to be able to take the lead on that but also be protected in terms of what they can and cannot do around the work experience. So we have put the guidance into place. We have written out to schools to say this is not something that we expect you to do tomorrow or next week but that you begin to look towards working towards the new recommendations that are in the guidance to support you, protect you and to support the young person in terms of their work experience. So we will continue to work with schools in terms of how they can implement the guidance that we have, that we have produced. Right, so Kim, there's definitely a miscommunication here, big time. Um, so what I'll give an example in my, in my constituency. So what has already started to happen is that the only children this term attending work experience placements are from grammar schools. The non-selective have had to put a vote on it. Um, they've told me the increase in terms of paperwork um, the, and also a number of businesses, small to medium businesses within the city have um, said that they will no longer be able to take those young people. Um, uh, now, as I say, that I, 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 we do need to have a meeting on this. So this term, and that I have the paperwork the fa that there's children, and also children from the special school, will not be able to attend work, work placement. I believe in terms of the 14 to 19 year old strategy that we were looking at breaking down barriers and opening up opportunities for young people from my community. It is very, very important that they get out to as many and as wide range of employers that there is because um, the fact is that the, their, their opportunities are limited. <coughs> um, we have a number of large companies within the city who, because of a, a large HR company or, or department, they are willing to um, go through it. Also, we have a, a, a broker that is funded through the Department of Education who is who's very, very, very restricted in their work and that has a detrimental impact on that. But even for myself, as a, a politician who takes young people and work experience, I have looked at the work, um, the paperwork. We will have to make a judgment on it. That's not something that I want to do because we take quite a number of young people in. Um, and it's and it's great, and I see them all coming up here. And you know, one of the things would be I probably couldn't bring them up here. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think yeah. it needs to be. And I actually would ask that you would step in and and actually maybe stall it at the minute and take the time to consult properly on it. <coughs> and, and thank you for that, Karen, and thank you for that feedback, because we have been receiving feedback, and hence we, we did write to all school leaders to, to suggest that, to say, continue with your own arrangements, and we can take a look at how we can, we, we can come back and look at the implementation. So I would welcome a meeting, absolutely, and we can okay. pick that up again.
Okay. I think I have uh, people coming for work experience next week, so so we we could do with urgent uh, feedback and clarification on that. I totally agree with Deputy Chair. I think work experience is invaluable in terms of um, educational and career pathways. So um, we we will need clarification on those matters um, and, and endeavour to communicate that through our various networks ourselves in, in order to maintain support for it. Um, have Robbie and, and Justin still to come back in? Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. OK. Um, I see that Arlene is in the room, so Arlene may well push this out a wee bit further, but I think you guys are well positioned to, to maybe look at this. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's roughly what William and, and Karen were both talking about, slightly two different topics. One was mental health and, and suicide prevention and the work that we need to do there. And then the next bit is about the lifelong learning piece and, and work experience. And so in term, I have a, not prejudice in our forward work plan, but I would imagine given the, the values that we all hold with regard to mental health and the provision of mental health, and, and, and I would be surprised if you didn't hear a lot more from us over this next two years and this mandate. Um, and you, you did give us some great information in around nurture, nutrition, early years, trauma-informed, but there are two distinctly separate elements because one's prevention, one's intervention. And I think in terms of our focus going forward, certainly <coughs> the energy that I bring will be very much focused in the preventative piece too and making sure that we, we order it so that we're not just trying to plug the dam, that we actually do something, something about that. But I, uh, and this is only my own opinion, it wouldn't be that of the committee, is that the big gap is in the curriculum, actually. And the big gap is that uh, we are valuing our children. We're measuring the school's performance strictly on academic uh, performance. And it's been, it's not your fault. It's the way we've developed as a society. But what I do feel is that uh, our curriculum is stretched to the point where um, there's very little value, if any, put on, uh, there's no mandatory piece for it. So I imagine in terms of whatever way it's written in, it's, it's, it's whatever way it's interpreted. Um, but I would just ask, would you be, uh, mindful and open to the discussion, the wider discussion with the department and ourselves with uh, developing a curriculum which actually integrates um, particularly the preventative piece. And, and, and I know there's a, there's a, a consultation out for nutrition at the minute, nutrition and that, and, and we know about food poverty and, and those type of things. And then nurturing the early years, which is good. So there's some good developed practice at the moment. Um, but I would be really keen to, to hear your thoughts in terms of actually Building something into a, a curriculum and a collegiate approach, by the way, because I don't think teachers should be the, should be actually perhaps the the, the, the delivery model for for that. Um, thanks, Robbie. If I could maybe just pick that up. I mean, one of the real benefits of the revised Northern Ireland curriculum when it came in in 2006 was the flexibility <coughs> in and around how teachers could shape the curriculum. Um, so there are two statutory areas that do encompass mental health and wellbeing within the curriculum. In the primary curriculum, it sits under what's called PDMU, um, Personal Development and Mutual Understanding. And so right throughout Foundation Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2, there are areas of the curriculum that need to be covered in and around personal development, which include resilience, emotional health and wellbeing and so on, which absolutely is where we build the foundations uh, for, for our children. In the post-primary, at Key Stage 3, we also have a statutory curriculum for personal development. It sits under the umbrella of learning for life and work. And again, resources that were developed um, at that stage when the new curriculum came in, um, called in sync were developed in partnership with psychologists, with social workers, with health workers, with educationists, a real rich variety of resources there and curriculum for, for school teachers. I think as you alluded to, the issue is how we value those aspects of the curriculum and what is not assessed is sometimes not valued as much. So it is about <coughs> how we can bring those areas more to the fore and say, how do we actually put more of a value in and around that? Because the curriculum does not stipulate the amount of time each teacher spends in each subject area yeah. and so therefore it is about raising awareness around how we begin to value those more and bring those more to the fore but they are there within our curriculum as it stands at the moment just one point on that just right. and, and yes justin justin was very, very passionate about this about the reduction in, in you know pe and, and physical education and we do have the rising sort of epidemic of obesity in children too mm -hmm. but definitely is in the, the values of what we measure and, 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 mm -hmm. and so, yeah. okay. okay thanks robbie justin very much second what you just uh, raised and discussed, Robbie, so thank you very much. Um, just in terms of the uh, constituency issue, issue, special schools, this now special school in our mind is extraordinarily 
popular and it has grown in recent years and most importantly it, it provides a very good education. Um, accommodation is completely cramped and overcrowded. Has consideration been given to a uh, new build? Um, I have to ask <coughs> one, one local issue a week yeah. for MLA here at this rate. Um, as I, as I free I to widen this to a wider matter if you can. At <laughs> <laughs> the moment, Justin, we're currently in the process of scoping out the feasibility for a school enhancement programme for the schools that will be up to the value of £4 million. So our teams are currently doing that and they're very close to finalising that and then being in a, in a place to submit a business case around that. I'm happy to pick it up in more detail and provide you a bit more detail. I'll, I'll, I'll write to you, and, and if, you, if you want me to do that. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that yeah, deal. Um, also, on school maintenance, and I recognise you might be able to answer this question just now, what is the backlog in school maintenance in terms of time and money? Um, I understand the cost of maintenance is skyrocketing, and uh, so what are the education authority doing to bring this under control? And do rising costs mean less work is being done and longer backlogs? Um, can we get an update in terms of the appointment of contractors to carry out the maintenance? Okay, I, I can pick up some of those points. Um, I'm not going to be able to pick up all of the points. So currently, the, the backlog is roughly in the region of about four hundred million pounds across all of the system. So I don't have that broken down by category or, yep, or sector. Just for maintenance. Just, just for maintenance. Now, some of that, what I'm going to move on to say is that in terms of what we would consider critical maintenance, so some of those issues might be things like decoration. So. We, we do uh, suitability surveys at the schools on a yearly basis um, and we put that all together in a system and it comes up with a figure of, of 400 million. Uh, there's probably about 90 million which we would consider to be critical. Um, on a yearly basis, so this current year, we, we've spent about 25 million pounds on maintenance across uh, the, the system um, and that's worked out about 1,600 schemes, Justin. So, uh, some of it is a bit about capacity, whether there's sufficient capacity in the system to do more, but there's also a bit about additional funding to do more maintenance as well. Okay, thank you. I just want to go back to what Robbie was mentioning earlier, the importance of physical activity in developing kids, not just from their physical health, but their mental health and their ability to learn as well. And what are the Education Authority's thoughts in terms of the cuts that have led to the, the removal of programmes that were having such a positive, effect, positive impact on kids and uh, how that can be made up? By your actions? Yeah, I, th I think it's back to our earlier conversations around our finances and how we have endeavoured, rightly so, to put our finances into the frontline teaching and to protect frontline teaching as much as we possibly can. And as a result of that, then <coughs> other initiatives and earmarked programmes and so on can often not then continue. But I would go back to say that physical education is part of the statutory curriculum. It is part of an entitlement for every single child. And again, it's back to how much we value the amount of physical education that is sitting within the curriculum currently and how we can continue to work alongside teachers to ensure that children and get as much physical activity as possible and then also when it comes to extracurricular activities how we can ensure that as many children as possible in a, 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 as inclusive way as possible can engage in extracurricular activities around physical activity so it's again down to to how much we can value that um, and work alongside schools and uh, to promote it more okay thank you very much the, the guideline amount of time of PE per week is not being met in our schools I, I, I don't know the, the details uh, in and around that, Chris, at the moment, but, but, I, but, but I, I guess I would surmise with a fairly cramped curriculum that you know, there, there's a lot of competing subjects in there uh, for, for teachers to cover. Okay, we can come back to that. Um, I just want to pick up on a few points members have raised before we bring our session <coughs> to a, a close. Um, in terms of the maintenance backlog that was referred to there, Dale, £400 million. Pounds, um, that isn't far off the total pressure on education in Northern Ireland. Um, what What is the real day-to-day -day impact on our schools and our pupils with that level of backlog? And how long will it take to clear that backlog? If I start with that first question, I can't give you an answer on that. I would need to go away and consider well, you must the have time some scale. Idea. You, you mu okay, the latter question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the latter right. question. Okay. In, in terms of the impact, I mean, the, the types of things that we're looking at are things like, for example, would be outdated heating systems in schools. It would be things like maybe the, the school needs uh, you know, electrical upgrading. Um, it might be roof repairs. Um, there's no doubt that the fabric of the building is likely to have an impact, but I couldn't give you an exact assessment on 
the scale of the impact on, on a child on a day-to-day -day basis. All I can say is that cer certainly it has an impact if, if the heating fails, then that may lead to a school closure, for example, uh, in the winter time. So it, it, it can have a, a real impact on a day-to-day -day basis. What, what is the, the state of our school estate overall in that context, in our your opinion? Mixed. I would say we have a mixed school estate in that we have some um, very new fit for purpose modern buildings that um, have um, been subject to new builds. We also have the school enhancement um, project which has um, the ability to make considerable impact to a school without it requiring um, a major works programme. But then we also have um, a number of schools who the fabric of the building is in poor repair. And I think William raised the point earlier, um, part of the maintenance backlog will include those schools who are in an area planning scenario, for example, in which if the future of the school is under jeopardy um, or that there is a question about it, that the level of investment is perhaps lower than they would be if they weren't in an area planning scenario. So while there will always be um, emergency works and we always will keep the school to a certain level um, that there are those schools who um, probably have the longest um, maintenance backlog are those with an area planning um, question mark around them. Okay I, th I think we need to probe that matter further as well when time allows us but I mean are there, are there, are there what is the extent of the amount of buildings that we have that are not fit for purpose in Northern Ireland? Well, they're all, they're all safe and they're all subjected to emergency maintenance and to um, the things that we need to do from a health and safety or disability access. So the buildings are all safe. Um, fit for purpose is, as Dale described, the suitability survey where we assess our buildings, if you like, against the, the handbook and, and as to what they ought to be if they were running um, as they ought to be. And, and what percentage of our buildings meet that standard? I, I would have to. We would have to come back with a, a specific figure. Okay, on that. that would be that would be good. It seems fairly essential. Um, can I ask, in relation to procurement that has been raised, why are school leaders consistently telling elected representatives that they believe they could procure? works, maintenance, services, equipment more effectively and at better value than the education authority? Well, in, in terms of, of the works that, that you refer to, that's actually a significant piece of work that the education authority has been undertaking over the last two to three years. Um, we, we actually have spent quite a lot of time engaging with principals on that matter. Um, whenever we meet with principals, that's a matter that, that, that they raise with us and we appreciate that it's extremely serious for them. We, as we currently stand, Chris, at the end of um, January, we have issued uh, new tender documents out to the market. Um, we've done extensive engagement with the market, and um, if the procurement pro process goes through that, that proper timeline, we hope to have a new contract in place for all of Northern Ireland, um, which will hopefully include better value to all schools. Um, well, we've worked really, really hard to drive down costs. So, for example, one of the things uh, schools would have spoken up, schools talk about, leaders talk about, things like painting their, their, their premises. So we have built in efficiencies into the new contract around that, and we will have a standardised pre standard price, which will apply across all of Northern Ireland. Um, we've, we've also um, built in, tried to be innovative in terms of bringing back some direct labour. So where you have those small value jobs, rather than a contractor coming in, we're going to employ our own staff. And we're going to basically a man in a van, for want of a better phrase, and we will go out and we will do those jobs for the schools ourselves, and we will hope to provide better value. Um, again, all I can say is that, that that work is just concluded. It's, it's out to tender at the moment, and it, uh, we anticipate that those new contracts will be in place for the new school year in uh, September 20. OK. Um, there are obviously a wide range of stark challenges there. Um, and area planning seems to be one of the key levers that you have for reform, um, which was touched on earlier as well. In terms of the sustainability of schools, is, is it possible to um, remind the committee of the, the threshold for sustainable schools in Northern Ireland? 
Yeah, in, in terms of the six criteria for sustainable <coughs> schools policy? Yeah, in terms of this, yeah. the criteria, the, the numerical thresholds. Yeah, yeah. So, so the sustainable schools policy, um, it's a policy from 2009, and it's outlined six main criteria through which schools um, can be judged in terms of sustainability. <coughs> I have to say, it's not that we say, oh, a school is five out of six or four out of six, so therefore it's in line for foreclosure or whatever. It is very much taken in the round and it's very much considered against the indicators that sit across those six criteria. So there's criteria in and around the strength of links to the local community, um, the educational experience of the pupils, the enrolments, the financial position, the school leadership, and the accessibility of the school. So those are the six criteria on <coughs> which we, we look at in the round in terms of sustainability for schools. OK. And how many schools in Northern Ireland would be short of sustainability criteria? Yes. Yeah. So, so, again, we can't say four out of six or five out of six means that they're not sustainable. But what we can say is we can use some of the thresholds that um, when Minister uh, Weir was Minister for Education that he set in place and that are listed in um, the, sustainable, the Sustainable Schools Policy. So for primary, we have 813 um, primary schools, 105 is the minimum for rural and 140 is the minimum for urban. So at the moment we have 258 schools below that threshold in primary and 555 um, primary schools above it. Um, and for post-primary, we have 196 schools. Um, again, what has been said to have been <coughs> under the sustainable schools policy is that in years 8 to 12, there should be a minimum of 500 pupils. And for post-16, that includes lower and upper sixth, there should be a minimum of 100 pupils. So again, our statistics at the moment show that 72 schools um, are below the threshold for years 8 to 12 in terms of the 500 enrolment, and 46 schools are below the threshold for 100 in post-16. OK, so you, <clears throat> what is your assessment of that total amount of schools that are below those thresholds? Yeah, so we are working um, for the, all of the schools, particularly the primary schools, in terms of the composite classes. If there are two or more year groups, those are the schools that we've been focusing on, and also the sixth form. Our issue and our assessment is in and around what we refer to as strategically important small schools. We absolutely need some direction around what the definition of that is, so that we can't use an arbitrary figure to say, actually, because you're below this threshold, it means that you're on the area plan for potential amalgamation or closure, because there are so many other factors at play. So yes, there's a lot more work to be done on that, but we also need to work with our department colleagues to begin to look at the Rural um, Needs Act, for example, the um, strategically important small schools, and lots of other community issues that will play into considerations in and around area planning as we move forward. So, and, and that's why we welcome the review, and as part of that review, the department are also going to be looking at the sustainable schools policy and beginning to, to look at how we address some of those issues through that. So, so that's very welcomed from EA's perspective. Because that's a, approximately 376 schools. That well, in terms of that, in, that uh, when we're just looking at enrolment, that, that, that's, the, that, that's the figure when we're just looking at the enrolment figures, yeah. Okay. And what, what progress has been made towards addressing sustainability of school factors or indeed reducing the number of schools that don't meet that yeah, so criteria? With, so within this current strategy, so um, the, the current strategy is uh, 2017 to 2020, or sorry, 20, yeah, 2017 to 2020, although we've extended um, this current action plan for another year. We have uh, published a number of development proposals. So in 17, 18, for example, we published 30 development proposals. 18, 19, we published 24. And to date, in 19, 20, we have published 20. I would say just because a school is within an action plan does not mean that it's automatically going to result in a published development proposal because that would preempt a decision in terms of a process that we need to undertake in and around area planning. But those are the figures uh, that we have uh, to date in terms of how we're, how we're progressing area planning. Okay. So, uh, so that's since 2017? So yes, yeah, since the those, start of the strategy. Okay. Yeah. Those are published development proposals. How many development propo how many outcomes have been achieved? How many changes have been delivered? <coughs> 
and so they're, they're published development proposals. They're not concluded development so, proposals. So How many development proposals have been concluded since yeah. 2017? So when they're published, then they go to the department for consideration. I don't have the exact figures in terms of how many the department have agreed uh, from that, but, but that's in terms of the work of the... Significantly less than the amount that have been published? Um, I, I, I can't say off, offhand, Chris, um, okay. the, number, the exact numbers. It seems likely that a small number of development proposals have been concluded since 2017 compared to the significant number of schools that have sustainability criteria factors to be examined is that fair to say well without a minister it has been it has been difficult once we publish then it's over to the department of education to begin their strategy objection period um, which is a minimum of eight, of eight weeks and after that then as a decision um, and the Permanent Secretary has been taking decisions in terms of some of those development proposals in the absence of a minister. Uh, so so that, that's the process in terms of um, how we move it through. Yeah. So that is a process that requires acceleration. Can you specify ways in which you foresee it being accelerated? Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose the main issue, although we're saying area planning should be accelerated, the main issue is the voice for the community. So if we can find a way of doing a lot of community engagement in the early stages before it actually becomes a, an individual issue that we are then consulting on, I think it would speed up the buy-in process in terms, of what, um, <coughs> in terms of what we need to do. There's no doubt that resourcing is another issue in terms of the EA. We have a small team working on area planning. We work very closely with our other sectoral partners and we work with CCMS, but certainly an increased resource uh, from our perspective would speed up the process. And incentivising the process is another absolute way that we could speed up area planning. Um, but I, I welcome another session that we can maybe go into um, yeah, the yeah, area planning in a little bit more detail schedule. around some of this. Yeah, very yeah. briefly in terms of community consultation, um, Ulster University Community Conversation Tool appeared to be a uh, useful intervention in that regard. Is that fair to say? Yes, so we've piloted a few programmes in around that, and that's something that we'd be very interested in looking at, um, how, we, how we develop that and take it further. Yeah. OK, um, I realise time is upon us. Justin, you have a final really quick one. Yeah. Sometimes you get the words mixed up. The word I meant to use earlier was homogenous, not monogamous, in terms of... <laughs> 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 Helpful clarification. <laughs> Thank you very much. Modulus is, is the word. Modulus. For the benefit of the team. For the benefit of Ron Sir. Um, okay. Um, officials, thank you very much indeed for your time to get. As, as you rightly acknowledge, um, there are matters that we'll need to return to in more detail. Um, the challenges are stark. They are going to require ministerial and political leadership, but there are a number of key areas that we need decisive educational authority leadership on, and we've touched on many of them in terms of teacher pay, school budgets, area planning, SEND provision, educational attainment and, and others. Um, and uh, there are a number of issues that we will need you to come back on in more detail, and a number of issues that I am not entirely convinced everyone will be assured of in terms of the responses that have been given today. So we, we are committed to working with you on those issues to try and ensure that that level of investment, reform and leadership is achieved. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. OK, can I ask the clerk to summarise the actions or requests for additional information resulting from our session today, yes, members? So, Chairperson, there's a few, uh, I think, there. Um, so, I think, is, Chairperson, is the committee content to write to the Education Authority on SEN, seeking an update um, on the timeline on site of the report on the internal audit in respect of SEN statements, seeking also a breakdown on the 80% or so of late statements, seeking an update also on the preschool SEN uh, consultation report, which I think the Chairperson mentioned. Yeah. I think that was all I had on SEN and on area planning. Um, they're seeking the report timeline for uh, the SIB report into area planning. Sorry, in terms of SEN, can we get some figures in terms of the ability of the education system to now identify those special education needs where that, that facility has been proposed the education system for you? So just in terms of the point I know, it's more, it's more bespoke and individual child 
oriented now, which, as, as was in my day, was more homogenous education. So that, that ability for the education system to be able to identify those children and how, to, how, how what metrics are available on that. Okay, okay. metrics. Right, very good. And also, there was the question, which I think the Deputy Chair mentioned, about number of children on a reduced timetable. Yeah, that has a statement. That has a statement. Statement. Thanks, Chairperson. Um, that was saying, so on area planning, uh, as I say, uh, writing to the Education Authority seeking um, the timeline and site of the SIB report into area planning, uh, seeking an update also on the position of area planning in respect of special schools. Um, mm -hmm. Commenting, I think that the committee is concerned around the progress of area plans and seeking particular updates around Elm Grove and Shankill. Any more? Yeah, Elm Grove and Glenwood. And Glenwood, Elm Grove and Glenwood. Yeah, but oh, oh sorry, okay, no problem. And Glenwood, okay. Um, so because you're seeking it from a policy point of view, also like, members can of course ask um, uh, AQ. Some might actually get a better answer and a quicker answer. Um, so on the third uh, point, which I think Mr. Mutin uh, covered, was around savings. So we're looking for them to, uh, there was a full business case, but just for the education authority as was, and to compare what was anticipated in terms of savings and what we actually got, mm -hmm. and also for a breakdown on the 100 million um, that they referred to. Uh, on, um, I, I'm not sure whether we were asking this, is the committee asking for just an update on the support and um, metrics, if there are any, around support for refugees? Uh, so number five then was, um, yeah, is the committee asking for baseline information from the Education Authority around their new customer care charter, just to see that things are improving or otherwise? And then additionally, um, sorry, can't read my own writing, um, yeah, work experience. So they're seeking an explanation of the new guidance on how this has changed. Um, and well, I guess is the committee also conveying some concerns about this? Yeah. Yeah. Who was consulted as well? Okay, who was consulted. Very good. Can I, just uh, on, on that one, uh, uh, in terms of how they measure the success of work experience, very good. Thanks, Chairperson. Members, uh, then um, moving on to maintenance, I think maybe we're seeking a breakdown of the £400 million uh, backlog of school maintenance, including the £90 million, um, which is said to be of the, sort of the more important end. Um, also looking for a number about the uh, percentage, if they can, of not for purpose, not fit for purpose uh, school buildings, and also maybe an update on the um, uh, processing of the tender for the maintenance contracts, which was referred to, um, and then sorry, sure. sorry. Yes, can we write to the, the committee to express our concerns about the backlog? Yep. Yeah. And can we ask them to appear before the committee to discuss some issue in detail? Okay. Agreed. Okay. So we want an oral brief on that. Also, chairperson, um, our committee can tend to additionally write to the department. Just seeking the policy position on the um, restraint and seclusion um, issue and whether they're planning legislation. And additionally, um, I don't know what answer we'll get, but the Education Authority indicated very clearly that they needed direction on what was meant by a strategically important small school to ask for the department to clarify. Agreed. Again, what they'll probably say, well, I'll not tell you what they'll Sorry. Well, they may refer us then to the SIB review and say it will come out of that, but at least you can say that we're asking. Okay. Additionally, sorry, Chairperson, finally, is the, um, uh, does the committee also want to write to the department seeking an update on the development proposal process because there were about 60 or, yeah, 60 or so were mentioned there just to see how far along they've, uh, they've got with those. Agreed, great, Chairperson. I think that was... Just one further one, if you don't uh, mind. Uh, uh, there was a question there with regard, and the answer was, was okay in terms of the, the uh, PDMU and the lifelong learning. Um, but, and, and that was then with regard to the curriculum, but I, I think I'd like to learn more of how the capture, how schools are doing that in terms of the volume that's being um, included in the curriculum at the moment, because I don't think it's, it's robust enough. Chairperson, um, we're getting a briefing next week about the mental health and emotional wellbeing framework. I'll write and ask yeah. them to, uh, when that, they uh, come along, to answer that question there. William, yeah. yeah. It's just on the question that um, I, which, which uh, you now answered in relation to the joined upness around um, suicide awareness, mental health, general wellbeing. Um, I think we need to tease out more what has been done in that joined upness and what more they seek and plan to do, because it, um, 
to wait Muli, and I would prefer to know exactly what is going to be done because it is a hugely important issue. Again, Chairperson, the Honourable Member will be content. I will write to the Department and the Education Authority in that regard. And hopefully, we will get to near the bottom of that um, next week when yeah. we come to talk about the framework. Okay. Members are happy. Okay. Members are also happy that some of those um, the Department might say to me, uh, look, we are going to come and brief you about this in about three weeks' time. Could we answer it then? Or are we content to be flexible on some of these? And you're going to trust the clerk to use some discretion on this. That there are clearly things you're very concerned about. You want to know now. Other things, maybe we could wait for the briefing. Is that okay? It probably depends on what it is. If, it you, is. if you let us know what response you receive, we'll we'll let you know whether we're content ah, at ah. that point. Yeah. Okay. Then. All right. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Okay. Thanks, members. Agreed, members. Okay, then, members. Item six uh, of today's business is our briefing from the Education Authority regards youth provision. Can I refer members to the following documents? A briefing paper from the clerk on EA Youth Provision at page 177, a briefing paper on the work of the EA Youth Service at page 187, information on the 2020 funding scheme for regional and local voluntary youth organisations at page 195, a briefing paper from the Regional Voluntary Youth Organisation Network at page 228, the DE 2013 Priorities for Youth document at page 231 and EA 2017 Moving Forward Report on the Outdoor Learning Service at page 269. Okay, members, can I welcome therefore the following education officials Arlene Key, Assistant Director of EA Children and Young People Services, and Michael Hogg, Strategic Services Manager with EA Children and Young People Services, and also to welcome uh, Departmental Official Andrew Bell, Head of the Department of Education Youth Work Policy Team. Can I advise members that the session will be reported by Hansard and invite officials to make a short presentation of no more than 10 to 15 minutes and then open the floor for questions. Thank you. You're very welcome, folks. Good morning, members. Um, I am delighted to have this opportunity to report to you today on the developments and innovative work of the Youth Services who deliver effective interventions and programmes to young people across Northern Ireland aged 4 to 25, in line with our policy to um, priorities for youth, improving the lives of young people through youth work. And by way of introduction, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our finance and resourcing, our partnership work, and particular highlight the role of the voluntary sector. Further to this, and I, will, I will detail a key response to your areas of inquiry. So first of all, finance and resources. The Youth Service has an annual ring fence budget of £34 million for revenue and £5 million for capital. This funding enables the delivery of frontline youth services, which equates to 73% of the budget, workforce development and curriculum support 10%, maintenance 1%, leaving 6% for administration. Finally, funding to regional voluntary youth organisations equates to the remaining 10% of the budget. Over the past three years, the Youth Service has restructured and reviewed service delivery to maximise the outcomes for children and young people across the region. The funding profile evidenced best value principles in line with DE's expectation to achieve strategic costs based reduction in non-teaching staff. In terms of our partnership working, the Youth Service has a very dynamic relationship with a range of government departments and statutory bodies. These partners lever significant funds to support the most vulnerable or, from our strength-based approach, the most valuable young people in our community. In addition, it illustrates how statutory bodies can comply with the duty to cooperate under the Children's Corporation Act. More importantly, it allows for synergy and enhanced working, reducing duplication of services and providing for a planned server service delivery based on the assessed needs of children and young people, as well as having the ability to provide an agile but evidence-informed response to emerging and acute needs. Strategic partners include the Executive Office as we deliver the TBUC Camp programme. This year, I'm delighted to say that we have 185 applications, which builds on the previous 128 camps involving 4,812 young people in good relations programmes 
providing enhanced opportunities for citizenship, edu for citizenship education and social action within local communities. During times of community tensions, we also deliver the summer intervention programme, and this summer, in 2019, we diverted 4,586 young people away from potential danger and criminality and be criminal behaviour. The Department of Justice funds targeted youth work to enable us to support young people involved in or at risk of paramilitary activity and influence. This week, this programme will engage with 150, 185 young people within the core group. That means the young people directly involved in paramilitary groups. Another important group is that of peers and siblings. And for the year to date, we have delivered bespoke interventions to 1,121 young people. These focused activities address risk, providing adventure through outdoor learning, addressing significant, significant mental health issues through alternative therapies, group work addressing harm reduction and self-management, mindfulness programmes and individual counselling. Therapeutic services provided through art, music and drama, aimed at providing a safe space to enable young people to explore and discuss the trauma, challenges and experiences they face are also provided. Importantly, the focus of this programme is to increase capacity to resist negative influences whilst reducing the influence that paramilitary groups have over these young people. The ongoing achievement of this work is most evident in Derry, London Derry, when in 2018, 425 petrol bombs were reduced to 25 and 219, 13 plastic bullets reduced to zero, six live rounds from armed gangs reduced to zero, and 38 arrests, of which 17 were children, reduced to one adult. The PSNI is a key partner in the delivery of our youth intervention programmes and as we seek to provide an environment where young people live in safety and stability. This work includes providing alternative pathways for young people at risk, enabling young people to have their voice heard on policing issues, provide training to PSNI officers on how to use a strength-based approach to young people, the most important aspect of this work is the link with detached workers who ensure a joined-up approach to young people on the streets. Supporting this direct delivery and interventions is representation and engagement with our officers and support hubs, which problem-solve to provide individuals with bespoke interventions. EA officers are also members of local policing and community safety partnerships, where we work tirelessly to address youth issues. The Public Health Agency supports the delivery of FLAIR, which is facilitating life and resilience education. It's a youth work response to identified young people who experience poor mental health. This important and evolving service is across the region and available to schools and youth groups aimed at young people aged 11 to 25 years. The model of intervention is one of social inclusion based on Egan's person-centred approach and it provides each young person with confidence through the relationship with a dedicated youth worker to move into a small environment with other peers where they will get support on their own similar issues. This unique service has resulted in young people reporting positive mental health and moving forwards. We wish to increase the capacity of this, ser this service to meet the very obvious demand. In addition, a curriculum for Key Stage 2, 3 and 4 is designed and delivered within 40 targeted post-primary schools and their feeder primary schools, that's over 100, for pupils who have experienced barriers to learning. This curriculum includes building resilience, understanding emotions and stress control. Early evaluation states that more than 80% of these young people are making positive progress on their mental health. The voluntary sector is an essential and significant partner in the delivery of youth services. Priorities for Youth determines that, young, that youth services should be provided based on the assessed needs of children and young people through the provision of regional and local plans. These needs are determined with the voluntary sector, plans at regional and local level are designed with the voluntary sector, and the voluntary sector is the preferred method of delivery within local communities. 
There are many other partners, including the Nerve Centre in Derry, who support the delivery of <coughs> effective accreditation in creative arts and digital imaging, health trusts as we now develop family interventions, and the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland as we tackle online safety for children and young people. So, in summary, I want to tell you that the Youth Service delivers effective youth work interventions with children and young people based on their assessed needs and through a range of effective and dynamic partnerships. In this regard, the Youth Service is key to the delivery of a range of outcomes for, from the Children and Young People st um, Strategy. Children and young people are physically and mentally health through a continuum of support from generic services through to bespoke intensive support that they learn and achieve through informal accreditation and our ongoing personal and social education, that they live in safety and stability through targeted work, that they make a positive contribution to society through youth participation, that they live in a society in which equality of opportunity and good relations are promoted through the embedding of community relations, equality and diversity in everything that we do. Your key areas of inquiry today included an update on the implementation of priorities for youth, outdoor learning and the new funding scheme. Implementation of priorities for youth. The key actions within the policy will be fully implemented after the deployment of the new funding scheme. This policy has been a very effective lever for change for the youth sector and has resulted in greater outcomes for our children and young people. In particular, it has enabled the Youth Service to articulate its impact and contribution to the educational attainment and progression of our children and young people into adulthood. Key actions include Youth Services are based on the assessed needs of children and young people. This year, the Regional Assessment of Need engaged with over 16,000 young people directly through a survey which to determine the importance of of access to open and universal services for all young people. They also highlighted the need to recognise their achievements and support and accreditation in the non-formal environment. They reiterated that a continuum of support was required for all age bands on their needs and at a particular point in time. This means that we will provide a dynamic, responsive and innovative service for all users. It is interesting to note that um, young people stated that the youth service needs to promote more widely the services available. This is supported because the young people involved in youth services presented with less challenges than those who were not engaged. Finally, the importance of having the voice of young people in the design and delivery of services was noted as a key success. This survey of young people is used by a wide range of government departments to inform decisions taken in regard to the planning and delivery of children's services. Priority age bands of 9 to 13 and 14 to 18 years are ensured within delivery and a new effective partnership with Playboard Northern Ireland is developing links and practice from play work and early years with youth work and its outcomes. For those young people aged 18 to 25, Years, a significant programme of leadership development is in place, which provides a pathway from a young person being a volunteer to be a full-time qualified youth worker. A key element of our youth work delivery is the support of Section 75 young people, rural young people and those who experience barriers to learning, including those who live in interface areas or areas of deprivation. Targeted programmes have been designed and delivered and evaluated to meet the needs of these children and young people. The Youth Service is experienced and intentional about providing an effective service based on evidence and has completed research into the needs of rural young people, the mental health needs of newcomer children, the involvement of faith-based and uniformed organisations in good relations, and many pieces of work around the START programme, which is our Tackling Paramilitarism programme, as well as outcomes for youth work practice. As previously noted, the work of the voluntary sector is of particular importance, and as a result, we have divide, devised a sector-wide volunteer strategy, particularly recognising the valuable contribution of the volunteer. We have also a workforce development strategy based on an extensive training needs analysis. This term alone that will range from autism being delivered to all youth workers with autism NI, strength-based approaches to youth work based on the circle of courage, effective support and supervision and training, 
and support to children um, who work with newcomers, and that will be delivered in partnership with our EA Intercultural Service. To improve the learning environment, the youth service is continually engaged in a programme of minor and major capital works to provide a more inclusive, welcoming environment for young people. These spaces are protected for the youth service by the provision of ring-fenced funding. Linked to this is the strategy to digitally transform front-facing services to ensure a, redu a reduction in bu bureaucracy to service users, with the most recent development being our online registration and funding portal. Your second area of inquiry is that of the outdoor learning service. <coughs> in accordance with the recommendations from the review, significant developments have resulted in enhanced outcomes for our young people and a more effective use of resources. Firstly, the EA Capital Estate has benefited from significant major and minor works, totalling £2 million. This has enabled Delamont Outdoor Learning Centre to increase its capacity from 34 to 60. Bally Home and Cork self-catering centres have benefited from a total, total refurbishment, refurbishment, leading to increased service provision. For example, Bally Home in the Causeway Coast and Glens area, which has 35 beds, provided a diversionary space for the young people from Derry Stroke London Derry who attended specialist camps from the 11th of July to the 25th of August 2019, with an average nightly attendance of 110. The majority of these young people were under canvas in the campsite and were supported by the newly appointed peripatetic staff. This provides an example of an effective partnership between the voluntary and statutory youth services responding to the significant needs of young people at risk. The outcomes achieved in this project link directly to the reduction of youth violence in Derry, London Derry, as noted previously. Specialist outdoor learning provision is now available in Delamont, focused on mortar activities, Gorda Toll focused on field studies and caving, Shannock Moor leading on land and hill-based activities, and Woodhall, which focuses on group work. The curriculum has been enhanced to provide a link to formal education and support children specifically as they transfer to, from primary to post-primary school. Accreditation at GCSE level has increased to include rock climbing, orienteering and geography field studies. Accreditation and outdoor learning is re-established, providing EA Level 2 hill walking and canoeing. Significant investment has been made within the workforce. A new staffing structure is in place, benchmarked against practice in the UK, with a total of 24 new staff employed, of which 12 are on a pathway scheme, providing skilled outdoor staff with the opportunity to attend university and gain professional youth work JNC qualifications. Our staff have completed National Governing Body Accreditation in High Ropes, and six staff are currently finishing Hill and Moorland accredited training, enabling EA to become a national training organisation. Currently, a training needs analysis is being complete to devise a workforce development strategy to spoke, bespoke to the new staff employed. It is important to note the investment in our young people. We have been given access to both a one- and two-year training opportunity for youth work and outdoor learning. This is delivered in partnership with Greenhill YMCA and the Share Centre in Lisnaski, and to date we have 36 young people engaged in this programme. Partnership work continues to develop with the voluntary sector and includes practice support for volunteers and trainees based in voluntary centres. As a result of the, of the review with the voluntary sector, it has benefited significantly and occupancy has risen between 20 and 40 per cent, with one centre always reporting, I'm always booked. Corrie Mila have reported an increase in bookings from 2000, in 2019 alone from three to 24 core EI groups. Share Centre have extended, have extended their operational period to include November to February, to February, and this has resulted in 10 new staff being employed. The EA centres have an average attendance of 80 per cent, and there are new schools and groups accessing the service. The partnership with the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, Joint Initiative Award, goes from strength to strength. A recent study, study visit with the Ulster Wildlife and EAA officers to Brookholes in Manchester provided a model of good practice which we are embedding across the re region. This introduces wellness days <coughs> to both the FLAIR and the outdoor learning programmes. 
Moving forwards, the next stage of development will be focused on consolidating the partnership with the voluntary sector, developing curriculum links aimed at supporting mental health and well-being, as well as designing new programmes on environmental awareness and sustainability of our world. Increasing the volunteer base of EA centres is also a priority. Lastly, um, your area of inquiry is that of the funding scheme. The new funding scheme is a key action within the Priorities for Youth policy, and its purpose is to ensure that services are based on the assessed needs of children and young people, and that the key characteristics of the wider policy is embedded, for example, priority age bans. The scheme was designed after considerable engagement with stakeholders, enabling the voice of young people and service users to be embedded into the design of the scheme on which there was a public consultation. The consultation resulted in over a thousand responses, which were broadly supportive of the funding principles and high-level proposals. There were no key themes identified within the consultation, and consequently, the EA Board adopted the proposals in October 2019. The proposals within the scheme link clearly to the Priorities for Youth policy and include six funding stream streams. New characteristics of the funding are funding is flexible and can respond to emerging needs. Funding will be available up to three years, enable us to plan more sustainably. It's an open call process and new entrants to the scheme are welcome throughout the year and a right of appeal is embedded into the process. Since the scheme was approved, EA Youth Service staff have been further engaged with the sector to design the funding portal and application process. 33 workshops were facilitated across the region in December, maximising the sharing of information for potential and existing funded groups. Significant time was invested in answering questions and queries about the new scheme. Feedback from this engagement has been very positive, and stakeholders noted the ease of access and the reduction in bureaucracy within the new application process. Currently, the youth service is supporting, is supporting voluntary youth organisations to register with the authority, enable, enabling us to review safeguarding youth work delivery to ensure groups meet policy and curriculum requirements. On the 3rd of March 2020, the new funding scheme will be formally launched, and additional help will be made available through support clinics. There are 110 available appointments commencing on the 10th of March 2020 ensuring across each council area every group will be supported. The new funding scheme takes effect from October 2020 and transitional funding arrangements are in place for two years until March 2022, when all historical funding arrangements will cease. So as I conclude, um, I hope I have given you the sense that we have a service that is vibrant, that is based on the assessed needs of children and young people, that works tirelessly with our voluntary and statutory youth workers on the ground in communities with our young people. And we are very committed to see that priorities for youth and the educational attainment of children and young people progresses as we proceed through our work. Thank you very much indeed for comprehensive briefing. It gives us as a committee an opportunity to recognise the invaluable work of statutory and voluntary youth work services across our community in developing health and well-being and attainment of our children and young people and we're delighted to support that work in, in any way we can. I have a, a number of members who would like to ask questions and can I, I start by bringing in William Humphrey. Um, thanks Chair. Thanks very much Arlene for the um, presentation. Can I say, first of all ask Michael and Arlene from the EA, Andrew you're from the department. Is that an uh, indication to this committee going forward that there's going to be a greater joined upness between the EA and the department? Well, I think I think the department and the education authority, particularly the youth service, have worked very well together uh, over the years, and, and we work. Uh, the intention is to continue to do that work. Um, and I think that there, there already is. I mean, obviously, I will make comments as well, but I think there already is quite a good joined up between the, uh, the department and the youth service. Right. Before I ask the Arlene and Michael question, so what role do you play in the, the stuff that we've just heard? Well, um, I am head of the responsible the, the priorities for youth policy. So um, we set the policy context within which the education authority actually deliver. Okay. Um, 
morning there has been, Michael, there have been criticism. You'll be aware in, in my constituency of, in terms of you talk about the interface stuff, and where the resources are very much um, <clears throat> perhaps focused in certain wards yeah. uh, uh, and whatever, and that that isn't replicated across the constituency. Um, now, I had a, recently had a, a meeting with um, uh, Mark McBride around that issue, and uh, he has sought to reassure me of those issues. Um, in terms of the um, diversionary stuff, which I think is hugely important and welcome, how can we assure, uh, assure the community out there that that will be across the piece for, for, for communities that are affected on interfaces and to, when there are hotspots in terms of interface violence? Okay. Uh, Chairman, I think there's two questions I want mm. to answer. First of all, the allocation of resources and where we have youth workers, and you know, William, we have been talking about this mm. over the past couple of years. We are in a historical funding pattern where resources are where they are. Um, we have where we have statutory workers work to support particularly your constituency, William, moving those resources around and making sure that we have the best coverage available. That's the strength of the new funding scheme. The amount of money that will be available in Belfast will be based on um, deprivation, priority age bands, the level of population and educational underachievement. So first of all, in terms of money being available within geographical areas, that will change based on the old Arnie formula, which is just about population. Secondly, um, you and some of your colleagues have been very involved in local consultations. We meet uh, with community groups, with uh, families, with parents and with young people to ensure that when we make a plan, it is very representative of the area. We are about to publish the area plan for your area. Tomorrow I'm going to the Education um, Authorities Children and Young People Services uh, Committee to seek approval for our regional youth development plan. Subsequently, um, within the next two weeks, the local area plans for Belfast will be published and all of the feedback from our local consultations will be in that. Why is that important? When we come to the launch of the funding scheme on the 3rd of March, we will be having an open call application for enhanced and um, increased services in your area to ensure that we meet the needs of children and young people where we know there is currently a deficit. Where we are unable to secure services from our colleagues in the voluntary and community sector, then it will be my, responsible to ensure, my responsibility to ensure that we deliver those services. Um, in response to your second question, there are two ways in which we ensure diversionary services are placed um, across the city. The first one is to say that the Executive Office scheme is a very particular scheme which we operate on our behalf. It is very targeted to those in interface areas and those who make application have to give very clear evidence of the need for the programme and the impact of um, the civil unrest and the need for the diversionary activity, so it's quite a high threshold to get over. Um, so we're very clear there's a multidisciplinary panel that assesses those and the Executive Office oversees that programme of work and um, we are very confident that the work that is completed there is a very high standard. In terms of core EAU services for all registered groups this last year, we enhanced their funding. They had £3,000 for the delivery of youth work during the summer at the times of of tension, whether that be July or August, and we gave them an additional £3,000 to ensure that they plan services from April to June, because we recognise if you arrive on the 11th night and you haven't made plans to work with young people, it's a bit late, and you have to put additional resources in. Again, those are based on historical funding arrangements, and moving forward, the agile ability um, for the authority within the new funding scheme means that we can launch um, programmes of work very quickly to get an immediate response on the ground to deal with something that we have unforeseen, but we have significant plans in place um, for both July and August um, to ensure that funding will go in this new funding scheme to ensure that we divert young people away from um, criminality and crime. Yeah. The other thing I've just finalised uh, that by saying is that there's a bonfire um, committee as part of the Northern Ireland office, um, and I referred to in my opening remarks the work with the PSNI. There is significant work both in the Tacklin Paramilitarism, the Bonfire, 
um, programme and ongoing work from the police to ensure that we engage with young people all year round. This year in South Belfast, we ran a pilot um, there with young people engaging them around the bon six bonfires, and the impact was significant with no issues whatsoever with those young people, yet we were able to enable them to celebrate their cultural heritage. So there are ongoing pieces of work uh, strategically within the government and uh, with our partners that are enabling us to respond to that. When you, when you go to this open call on the 3rd of March, yes. how, how are you going to deal with, because I have a concern I've raised with government and local government, about um, some communities are, are, are uh, better off, better well disposed in terms of capacity yes. and the ability to make these applications. Yes. How are um, you going to deal with the, the communities that don't have that capacity? That's a good question. Um, first of all, we work with the Department of Communities um, on this uh, work, and we recognise we also work very closely with Belfast City Council and Nigel Grimshaw. And we recognise the amount of work that goes in from a range of government departments to build capacity in these areas, even the B4 areas that are within the um, Technical and Paramilitarism programme. The capacity of these areas is very well noted um, and researched. So it's not something that is going to be done by the Education Authority on its own. It's something that is being looked, get, looked at across all government departments. But um, with regard to the youth services, we will actually be tasking and providing an opportunity within the voluntary sector, regional voluntary youth organisations, for them to support and build capacity within local communities so that they can, moving forward, take account for that money and move that forward. So that is something that we have taken into consideration and will actually be funding within the new scheme. Okay. Can I just ask then, um, Chair, in terms of the um, outdoor learning centres yes. um, that are referred to in Table 1 on page 279 there, I remember in the previous mandate there was a debate about, about when the, the uh, decision was taken to close outdoor centres. Yes. Uh, and I remember speaking in that debate. How do we get? How did we get in terms of Delamont? If I can use that as an example in County yes. Down. Um, how does the EA work uh, in terms of making sure that it is well used, facility, and, and obviously um, the investment that that's in, was needed there to bring it up and whatever? Whenever you've got the department that presumably gives funding to the likes of Crawford's Burn Scout Centre. The guide centre at Lorne, the uh, I don't know BB um, facility at Ganaway. There's Ardaloon in Newcastle, which is owned by the, and run by the Belfast Activity Centre. How, how how do you do the work, or do you do the work to ensure that we don't have a duplication? Yeah. The, the the centres that you have remain viable, whilst the other centres that are owned by these orga other organisations yeah. continue to provide the what's needed services well. Because obviously, given the numbers that you talked about earlier, yes. they probably all can't be facilitated in, in your own facility. Yeah. Um, there's three elements to the uh, question that you've asked. One is around capital development. One is around the assessment of need and what's delivered and how we can best do that. And then there's one around what the Education Authority does. First of all, the voluntary sector have access to a capital scheme within the Department of Education for which the Education Authority has no responsibility or links. And all of the organisations that you have just mentioned um, can apply directly to the Department of Education and do um, receive funds for those buildings. We are with our colleagues in the uh, Department of Education um, working on how we can ensure that priorities for youth is supported and that there's a greater joined up approach to ensure that the assessment scheme that is uh, deployed by the capital section in the Department of Education meets our policy directives and enables us to deliver our, our um, work. Secondly, um, the, some of the centres that you mention um, are also funded by EA, so that goes back to our policy directive. We want to make sure we fund the voluntary sector first and then only deliver where there's no viable alternative. Um, so we do work very closely with our colleagues. We have had our first annual conference um, facilitated um, by the voluntary sector with ourselves to look at what training is there for staff, what programmes are aligned to the curriculum and what we need to provide. So whilst we have had an increase in participation and uptake of our services, we are working across the whole sector um, and indeed with the private sector. Recently this year, we went out to a private, with a private tender to a number of organisations to buy in additional beds and outdoor learning um, activities from our uh, other 
many hundreds of providers across Northern Ireland. So I believe that we have consolidated our position. We never wanted to be an EA in a position where we could take all the bookings. We wanted to make sure that we were providing a bespoke service that the voluntary community sector couldn't, and that it would enable us to focus on the educational attainment of children and young people and link directly to the curriculum, and that is what has been provided. But the partnerships with the voluntary sector are very strong and are progressing. Okay, going to need to move on. Happy enough, William. Thank you. Um, okay, Deputy. Oh, sorry, Catherine Kelly. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Arlene. Arlene, um, further to the briefing that we had with yourself, I think it was myself, Kieran, and Chris before Christmas. Um, you explained to us that in relation to priorities for youth, that all youth groups groups could apply. Yes. Um, if they're registered with EA. Correct. How does that affect the independent? Um, youth organisations that are out there? So, um, independent uh, youth organisations uh, were never able to apply for youth work, for youth work um, funded by DE unless it was an open scheme. So, for example, the Executive Office scheme for both the Together Build United Community Camp Programme and the Summer Intervention Programme is an open scheme to anybody. Um, so, there was always registration um, available for all of the previous historical ELBs to enable people to get registered. One of the major um, complaints that we had was that that registration process was very long and arduous, and in fact it was a 16-page document. That has been reduced to one page. Uh, there's an online resolution. There's a, a, um, a film I made, a, I made available online to show people how to complete, and we're in the process of supporting clinics to enable young people to register. Um, just checking yesterday with registration just open, we've over 600 groups already registered um, in the past few days. Um, so to enable us to support um, local groups on the ground, they must be registered with the Education Authority, and that enables us to check the safeguarding that they are, they are delivering DE work. And also, um, my constituency is West Throne, it's a rural area. Um, where there's a high proportion of children, young people, and many in low-income families, um, and some at risk of, of social isolation. Um, in developing a youth strategy in line with rural needs, what actions have been taken to increase the participation of children um, who are hard to reach? Yeah. Um, three things. Uh, first of all, we had an audit uh, of where we have um, rural young people and what their needs were. Um, and that I refer to as our um, research that we conducted into the needs of rural young people. I'm very happy to make that available to you. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have spent the last 12 months um, around all aspects of Northern Ireland, specifically talking to rural young people directly. Um, we also provided an enhanced programme in partnership with the young farmers, um, where they were looking at... Um, what a model of delivery could look like, and as well as that, we have enhanced funding for rural youth work. And moving forward into this funding scheme, that is something that is a given priority. It's a very important priority for our EA board, um, and they are actually looking at we've mobile provision as well, so you don't have to necessarily have a building. Um, we have extensive partnerships with councils so that we can book community halls and council facilities and use them on an ad hoc basis. So I feel that we are going to have, by the end of 2020, a very comprehensive strategy of how we're going to meet those young people. There are two key issues that they have told us that requires um, response wider than the youth service. One is always about internet access and how, um, how, how speed the broadband is and all of that. Um, and we do have services that we fund that actually take dongles and different <laughs> um, modes of operation to enable that we get access to um, ICT for our young people. Um, the second one, second one is transport, and the last thing I would say is that we have prioritised our rural young people. We had significant difficulties last year when the regulations changed around who can drive a minibus, um, but all our rural youth workers have access to minibus. We invest them to get the appropriate licensing, and we make sure that we have transport in place for those young people. In addition, where we didn't have enough buses or enough staff to um, pay for that, to, to drive those buses, um, we went out to tender and now have in place a tender where we can call on and ensure transport is in place for all rural young people to access your services. Um, finally, I would say that the young people have also told us 
when they're in school and they've got the transport there and they're in school, it's easier to do things. So we're piloting programmes in school and twilight sessions to ensure that we have the young people when they are there and then the issue is we'll have to get them home from there. Thank you. Just also on that, uh, Catherine, as part of the, the survey there's, that we talked about, 16,000, over 16,000 young people contributed to that. 40% of those identified as living in a rural area. So we were able to ensure that that was embedded in, in our regional planning processes. Thank you. Okay. okay, Robbie Butler. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Um, you covered a huge amount of ground there, Arlene. I think you didn't want a lot of questions, so... <laughs> you fired out a lot of stuff, and then William we, and the Catherine come in. Are you okay for us to move on then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. I want, my, I want my moment in the sun. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, um, so I'll ask a wee question at the end, because... Uh, these guys have covered uh, the two things perhaps that I was, I was most going to talk about the social isolation and loneliness piece actually that Catherine yeah. mentioned um, uh, perhaps there might be a question in there you talked about technology but perhaps there might be a, a, a look at technology to reach the people not always have to have them in the room there's a number of reasons for that it's not just it, it, it could be down to personality it could be down to the social difficulties and stuff yeah. there might be something we could maybe grow on that um, but you, you did raise um, a good point that I noted and uh, it's, it's to do with the training that's went into youth workers and mm -hmm. I just want to pay credit as a chair to, to to the work that they've done on yourselves especially over this last three years when we had the political vacuum and we saw the propensity for other people to validate our young people and uh, we were facing a challenge that we haven't faced for maybe 30 years uh, so well done to those guys for that um, you talked about autism training uh, for youth workers however there's also a propensity of ADHD uh, which is actually uh, more prevalent so you've got we've got uh, young people with autism one in 30 they're talking about we're talking about ADHD one in ten and actually when you look at the uh, intervention where it's required in terms of the uh, judiciary yeah. and the propensity of AD, ADHD in our young people particularly young males it's very prevalent yeah. so has there been any look at uh, and awareness and training in around ADHD and yeah. what can we do? Um, there has been uh, training complete uh, on that for our full-time uh, staff. In addition to that, in certain areas where we have schools and youth service together, we actually have youth work programmes um, working with young people who have uh, HD, ADHD. In addition to that, in our three-year workforce development strategy, which I refer to, um, it is noted in there. Within the young people at risk category, particularly those young people who are in EOTIS, those young people who are not in mainstream school, those young people who we work with on the streets and those young people who are in uh, Lakewood or in Woodlands, um, both autism and ADHD is a significant issue. So all of the staff there have a higher level um, of training. So we provide training based on the assessed needs, but it is something that is written in our priorities for youth policy that states that on an ongoing basis where uh, there needs to be greater collaboration and work between special educational needs and the youth service to ensure that youth work staff have the ability to do with all, uh, deal with all SEM. Um, I would say that in the majority of our youth work, if we deal with it realistically, is carried out by volunteers, uh, over 80% of it. Um, and the majority of those volunteers um, would not all have access uh, to youth work training. Um, but where it is a necessity, we will be giving the headquarter organisations the funding to make sure that that is cascaded so it's proportionate to the level of delivery. So in other words, what I'm saying, those part-time and full-time members of staff for whom work with these young people on an ongoing basis, they are trained and can train, train, training will be provided on an ongoing basis. I, I just, okay. just finish that out just very quickly. Very quickly I think yeah. it's really important. I have to declare an interest because I'm an officer in the Boys' Brigade and yeah. so I come across yeah. instances where I've yeah. certainly never received training through the Boys' Brigade yeah. before that. However, and it's good that, that, that young people who come to our notice obviously get that in the more intense settings and so on. However, a barrier to young people taking part in these youth services will very much at times be demonstrated in their behaviour. I yeah. think we need to really push that training down um, to the volunteers um, as, an, as almost an essential to show that we're not um, setting young people up to fail and, and creating barriers for them to take part in the services. So that's okay. exactly, so regional strategic funding, sorry Chairman, Re Just very quickly, yeah. regional strategic yeah. funding enables for the first time um, headquarter organisations, namely the BB, to provide curriculum and training support to all member organisations, which was previously not there. Okay. Okay. I'm conscious we have another uh, briefing to take as well, so if I could encourage us all to keep our questions and our responses as concise as possible, I realise it's a detailed matter, but uh, would ask us to do that. Deputy Chair Karen Mullen. 
So I'm going to apologise in advance. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> because Arling knows how passionate I feel about our youth work and our young people. Um, and giving our young people opportunities, and particularly reducing barriers to learning. And I was no more happy. I was so delighted yesterday when I went home and seen a social media post of 15 of uh, our youth workers in Derry getting on the bus to go and start their youth work degree. So thank yous for that. It's, it's, it's excellent. And there's so much excellent work. And I know we're short on time to go into detail today, but there's some stuff I want to just go over. William uh, rightly raised um, the START programme, and I'm delighted to hear that um, that has been looked at because they, those issues are not area specific. No. Um, and I know, um, just really would ask you that if you could come back to the committee with detail on that, hopefully the evaluation have, has picked up the learning and that and, and a timeline around that. Because I know of the excellent work that has been done in my constituency by the Long Tower Youth Club and St Mary's. Yeah. Um, so I would like to know, you know, if that's going to be extended, but also extended throughout dollar areas. Okay. Um, and also, I suppose, just leading on from that, you had mentioned um, in your briefing around the work um, and the intervention that was able to be made in, in Derry over the last two summers. And that was down to the flexibility, um, the hard work of yourselves, the flexibility of the funding and our excellent youth sector and our youth worker alliance that we have in the city. And I'm already seeing the benefits, not only in a terms of reactionary way, which, but that has now turned down now to many years ago of a planned approach. And you've talked about a range of those there. So I'm great and delighted to hear that those are growing. I'd like to say that the learning and the good work will be re replicated across the education sector and all our departments, particularly when we talked about autism training. You know, and uh, if, we're do, if we're doing it with our youth workers, you know, um, we were debating in here on Monday around for our teachers, so well done again on that. Oh, um, just my last point, um, Arlene, is around the feel for fun. Yes. So again, you know, the excellent work that was done last year and uh, I commend the Education Authority for expanding that. We, myself, had engaged with a number of groups and stakeholders. We, there was a small piece of funding. From that, um, obviously that work that was done last year that was a pilot, I've wrote to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, along with the Minister for Education and the Minister of Communities, asking that um, they now take note of the evaluations from last year um, and plan for the summer um, the, and work alongside the excellent organisations um, in the community and voluntary sector, urban villages and uh, CINE who have been doing this for a number of years. So I just want to ask you, are you, are you aware, um, I haven't had an update on that, are you aware of plans and do does the Education Authority plan to run out a uh, food initiative programme this, sum this summer? Uh, we would want to run out the fish initiative uh, this summer and we want to do that in two ways. First of all, when people apply for summer funding programme, that, that will be an element that they can claim uh, funding for. Um, to extend it uh, in the way that we would like right across the region is going to require um, additional resources. It is a very small amount of money for what we achieved, and it's not just about providing food to those young people who don't have it. It's the educational attainment of the children around that because they're learning um, about nutrition. And very importantly, it's about those young people giving back to the community and to themselves. So it's not just a simple matter of the nutritional value or enabling young people um, to survive during the day. So yes, we're going to embed it within the funding that we have as a key criteria and something that people can apply for funding for, but that doesn't increase the pot of money that we have to roll out um, uh, across other areas. So I would value um, the joined up approach from government to see how a very small amount of money, I think, could enable us to run that right across um, the region in particular areas. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Rob Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, I've only got very short questions, but of 25 of them. <laughs> uh, can I first of all welcome Arlene, Andrew and Michael and a very positive report that's being presented to the committee today. And thank you for that. But just briefly, if you could, uh, on a, a few items. Can you let the committee know what you'd refer to as a historical funding uh, pattern? What has been the impact on your budgets since the formation uh, of VA? And could you maybe just say a few words to tease out on the relationship with the uniformed organisations uh, and perhaps the Duke of Ed, uh, uh, Princess Trust, those briefly? 
Yeah. And you had referred to the, you know, the work that you were doing, and you had benchmarked it uh, against good practice yeah. across channel. Yeah. And what the outcomes of that benchmarking yeah. were? Okay. Uh, first of all, regarding uh, funding, Chairman, um, the uh, Education Authority uh, Youth Service um, is very grateful to the Department of Education. Our budget has remained static for a number of years. That does mean, in actual fact, um, a, a decrease because of all of the inescapables which have increased. Um, we have protected the voluntary and community sector in that regard, and in fact, we have increased the funding to the community and voluntary sector. In terms of historical funding, there has been enhanced funding to those groups who have traditionally received our funding because of additional funding made through the ministerial funds for extended um, provision and for the inclusion of children who um, have uh, access to Section 75 areas. So there has been no detrimental value to those who have been historically funded. We have had significant contact from groups who um, do very good youth work in areas where they have never had access to government funding for youth work, and that has been um, the biggest uh, difficulty. Um, with regards to the benchmarking that we do, um, we take that very seriously. And um, very recently, we were in Scotland. The uh, Scottish Youth Service commissioned work through the Edinburgh University about the impact of um, generic or generalist youth work. And many of you in the previous session were asking questions about how do we enable young people's mental health and how do we secure the development of young people from everything that we do. So we are actually enhancing in this new funding scheme the opportunities for generic youth work to be funded because we know that when young people receive generic youth work that is best um, valued. In terms of our other work, we benchmark our outdoor learning in terms of um, the type of staff and the outcomes in the curriculum offered um, in England. Um, in our work with at-risk young people, that is benchmarked across Europe. We're just about to launch um, research, which I'll very happily send to you, which benchmarks our work um, across 14 different countries. Um, and it's saying, um, in terms of that work, what were the core components of it that made it successful? Um, it looks at the, the work that we're doing to say what characteristics of the work that we need to develop. As a result of that to date, I can tell you that the one thing that we want to develop further is the mentoring of young men. <coughs> and that has been identified as something um, that we need to go and explore more and do. Um, so we not only um, complete research and have an evidence base for the work that we do to make sure that we're making progress and to make sure that we can measure the impact that we do, but we do regularly benchmark it, benchmark it across um, word best practice. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Justin McNulty. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for your, your detailed and comprehensive presentation. Um, yeah, take a break. Yeah, yeah. It's very evident the passion and commitment you have for youth services, so thank you very much. Um, yesterday, I attended a, a meeting of different youth groups in Sticky Fingers Arts Centre in Uri. It was uh, hosted by Gronya Powell. And she's determined to set, set up a children's forum action plan which addresses anxiety, depression, uh, bullying, and uh, mental health issues for young people, which is very, very positive. But at that meeting, I met somebody from another youth group, Bosco, yes. in Uri, and they have £85,000 per year funding. Good. Now, uh, Jim McGuigan, who is very uh, involved in that, is, is very concerned about the new service delivery model, which may impact their ability to deliver that, that the programmes themselves, where they have to make, might have to go through procurement. So can you just let yeah. me know what, what, that, what his concerns are and what your um, okay. understanding is? Um, first of all, um, that's a, uh, St John's Bosco is a very valuable uh, youth club um, and a significant partner for us. Uh, we work very closely with them and they will have the opportunity to meet with us in one of these funding clinics to support them complete their application. Um, I think there's a, a confusion there between um, having to go through a formal procurement process to access funding for youth service. That's not what we're doing. Um, we are uh, putting an application process in place uh, that um, is very easily accessible and we've actually engaged with the sector to design to make sure that the questions are uh, easily answered and understood, and also they understand what we're going to be marking and assessing on. We would not um, 
see any risk to any procurement process within youth work going forward to purchase services. We, are, uh, we work through a grant aid process, but as a result of your comments today, I would, uh, um, we can go and Michael can go and meet with them and we can reassure them both of the process. The funding portal is actually live and you can see it. Um, I give you a link to it on my um, paper to brief you for today. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a, a confusion there around what actually we're doing and the reality. So I can assure you that there is no procurement process for the delivery of your services. Okay, well, Jim would appreciate that reassurance, Michael. So appreciate okay. that in advance. And very quickly, you mentioned policing. Um, how positive is, is it that we now have more hearty support for policing from all the parties in here? Uh, I think there was good moves yesterday. Um, I think there's something on the start which may have influenced that, but. How positive is that that all the parties more, are more enthusiastically supporting policing now for the development of youth services and the ability of youth services to work with police? It's very important um, because our children and young people are on the streets where the police are having to patrol um, and our young people have a particular view um, on how they feel that the police understand them and treat them um, and we have been very clearly involved uh, in a whole conversation with the police in terms of the advocacy role on those children and young people. That has actually resulted in us um, having an independent from the police youth participation structure from local area right through to regionally, where in an ongoing way, the um, young people across Northern Ireland will be able to communicate clearly their views on the police. We do have uh, youth clubs, youth workers, and communities who find it difficult, their relationship with the police, and we understand that. Um, our uh, supportive partnership with them has been around working with neighbourhood policemen, advising them on how uh, they could approach children and young people in a different way. And the training that I referred to earlier, the Circle of Courage, we have been um, delivering uh, piloted first in Derry Strip, London Derry, and then moving across other areas to enable them to see how they could approach young people in a different way when you're on the street and when there is a potential for an interface or a, an argument. You want to de-escalate the situation, not escalate the situation. So we're not there to say the police um, uh, shouldn't be doing their job, but in the past year we have had significant um, developments with them at a very leadership strategic level and a very operational level, and I think CARM will be able to um, give evidence to that, that it ha has been very effective to enable the police to stay out in certain situations, for the police, um, when young people are perhaps under the influence and on the streets, to enable us to respond to that so they don't even have to engage the police at an early stage. So I would say there are significant um, arrangements um, and partnerships in place that are enabling us to have a very positive working relationship moving forward. Okay. Thank you. I ask a few very brief very brief questions hopefully you can give very brief answers to. Um, are, are there budgets for each funding stream, stream set? Um, so the, uh, the answer to that is, is yes. Um, we, um, funding is now based, we are plan on a council area um, and the funding for the council area available for each of the funding streams is made up on a formula. Um, as I mentioned earlier, population, priority age bands, uh, deprivation and rurality, which is also very important. Um, and then within the funding streams, based on the local area plan, uh, the local youth senior youth officer sits down with Michael and myself and we agree based on the assessed needs within that area and to deliver the plan, how much money we need to go into each funding stream and what we need to deliver. There needs to be an element of that, Mr Chairman, where we can respond to in an agile way to the ongoing needs and we have the provision available to do that as well. Is it possible to provide any level of detail with regards to the amount of budget for each funding stream to the committee? We will be able to do that um, when two things happen. When the Regional Youth Development Plan uh, is uh, agreed this week uh, with the Education Authority and the Board at the end of the month, and secondly, when we finalise the local area plans, we will be able to give you that in early March. Okay, and is there a published assessment criteria for each stream? Um, there is, uh, and it's available and on the website that we gave you, and I'm very happy to send that to you again. Okay. Uh, last two. Uh, how will regional youth organisations with individual young people as member, for example, disability, be included in these streams? There are uh, 
three ways in which um, that can happen. First of all, regional project funding will be available to um, support the delivery of curriculum training and enhance the quality of youth work across the region for all Section 75 groups, including those with disability. Um, in terms of ongoing local project work, there will be specific projects written to make sure that those children and young people are included and provided for in youth service. Um, thirdly, within our local area plans, um, that will be a key element of every programme of work. Okay. And will existing uh, funding streams for Irish language youth groups be included in the new model? So there's, there's two things. First of all, there's a, a transitional funding scheme that enables all Irish medium um, youth groups, whether they get funding just for the summer or ongoing work, to be um, funded. And in the new funding scheme, um, Irish medium youth work will be able to apply for all the various strands of funding based on what they're doing. So I would imagine that there will be um, a more strategic uh, approach to that, a developmental nature, enabling it to be extended and then provision for local delivery as well. Okay. And there's maybe a few items that we'll come back to you on, but thank you very much indeed for your comprehensive briefing today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, members, um, we will need to agree uh, a few items of action further to that briefing, and we do have another briefing from the regional uh, regional voluntary youth organisations network, which supports almost six thousand local youth community and church groups uh, across Northern Ireland. So. Can I propose, however, a very, very brief first break, um, and we will return to this uh, final item agenda immediately after? Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Thank Thanks you. very much, members. Okay, members, I'll call us back to order and give the clerk a brief opportunity just to recap on actions we need to agree further to our previous briefing. So, for the previous briefing, chairpersons, committee content to write to the education authority seeking. Um, site of the research that they had undertaken on hard to reach children, um, seeking also um, information on the START initiative evaluation and uh, its plans, if any, to extend. Also seeking information on the food initiative that was uh, run over the summer and whether there are any plans going forward for this to be rolled out across Northern Ireland. And the site of the benchmarking research around the efficacy of youth work. And finally, uh, seeking a breakdown of funding by council area and also the criteria for access to funding. Members are content with all of those? Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Okay, then, members, agenda item seven is our briefing from the Regional Voluntary Youth Organisations Network. I'm glad to welcome both Chris Quinn and Andy Hewitt to our meeting today. Um, I would invite you to make a short oral statement um, in regards to the youth sector provision, uh, no more than five to ten minutes, and then we'll take questions from members. You're very welcome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just, just briefly to highlight, I put this on your, on your table there, which is a little bit of an outline of who we represent. So regional voluntary youth organisations, sometimes known as, as Network Youth NI. Um, we represent 27 regional voluntary youth organisations, and they're named on the front of that uh, pamphlet there. Uh, some of them are large infrastructure organisations providing governance support for, for youth and community groups. Some of them are smaller, more thematic groups, maybe arts-based or inclusion, participation, etc. Um, but in terms of our uh, reach, we would, we would reach 141,000 young people per year. Um, and close to 7,000 volunteers and paid staff across those 27 organisations, uh, as well as nearly 6,000 local youth groups. Uh, the key themes that we cover are, are mentioned in here. Mental health is a big one. Employability is a, is a key one for us. Volunteering, citizenship, uh, inclusion, and play work uh, as well. Um, uh, you know, reconciliation as well would be would be another one. Uh, safeguarding is a big part of what we do, um, and contributing to what's already been talked about this morning in terms of, of workforce development uh, is a key aspect of it. Um, so I think uh, you received a submission in, from us in relation to the new funding scheme, and um, in fact, a number of the questions that you asked. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this morning were, were, were part of our qu questions, Chris, and I think... It might have been uh, even uh, intentional. Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, so that, that was helpful from our point of view. Um, I suppose, before Chris gets into some of the detail of it, 
I would want to say that uh, as a sector, as a body of 27 organisations, um, this is a substantial change. It's a substantially new um, funding regime, I suppose, and that is 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 welcome. It's it's necessary, but it also brings a certain level of, of anxiety, probably, for some of the groups that we represent. Um, and that anxiety probably stems from an element of uncertainty around the detail, which you alluded to, perhaps in some of your own questions there, Chris. So uh, when we were responding to the original consultation, it asked us to, for each of the funding stream, streams, do we agree, disagree, or uncertain? And most of our members would have responded, we're uncertain because we don't know the detail. We don't know the uh, total budget for each of the streams. Uh, we don't know the criteria for each of the streams. And um, I think uncertainty would be uh, one word to describe how some of the groups that we represent feel. So um, on, on, that's maybe just a, an overview of where we're at. And maybe Chris can pick up some of the detail yeah. around that. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the committee for inviting us today. It's great to see you back in action. Um, we're delighted that we're in front of you again. Um, and as Andy says, we represent the, the network. I also work for the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, um, so you'll probably hear a bit of Youth Forum perspective coming in as I talk to you. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm, I'm, it's regretful that the and left the room because I, I think it would have been really helpful had they listened to our concerns. Because for us, this is part of our frustration. Um, there has been a, there have been barriers in terms of communication with the A and D and how they respond to our concerns. What I had prepared to say had Arlene and Andrew still been in the room, that I I was asked by my committee to seek some sort of assurance that my being here today in no way um, uh, put our organisation in the firing line or under threat, because our experience of the last two to three years is that those who speak get punished. Um, and that has been demonstrated through withdrawal of funding and marginalisation. So there's a, there's a big risk for me and my organisation today. There are people that phoned me before this meeting to say that they weren't prepared to present in this public forum because of fear of what the recourse might be. And they have requested that the committee meet with them privately, if that's possible. Um, so, just to move on, on a positive note, we... Chris, if I, if I just come in very briefly to say that we're obviously extremely grateful for y your, your presence here today, and we recognise the wide range of yeah. youth work provision you mm. represent. Um, we take heed of what you have said in terms of those concerns, and we'll ensure that anything that you raise today that is appropriate to action and get further information on from um, from Arlene Key and from the Education Authority that we'll, we'll do that and we'll yeah. seek assurances that people seeking to make a positive contribution to this process are not in any way penalised for yeah. so doing. Um, thank you. All right. No That's problem. really good. Thank you. Um, look, I, just, I wanted to open by saying that we, we recognise and we welcome the new funding scheme. We recognise that the old systems were outdated and they needed to be reformed. We wanted to put on record our thanks to ENDA for the hard work that they've done because I would argue that this is the establishment of EA for me is possibly the biggest piece of public sector reform I've seen. I would say in terms of the amount of people it affects, it's bigger than things like policing and, and those big, big issues that we've grappled with. So I think that needs to be recognised. Um, we do have concerns about the process and how it was described there by EA. Um, there were issues around the consultation and about the communication, as I said in my opening. Um, and there have been questions with regards to the allocation of funding outside of the scheme and communication with certain groups with regards to their futures, um, as well as assurances of what funding they may receive. Uh, they may receive. Whilst other people or other groups um, can't seem to engage at all in any meaningful way with the Education Authority. When we look at priorities for youth, it states that strategic funding that is given to often well-established youth organisations recognised to be of strategic importance and whose continues, continued existence and activities are considered to be beneficial to delivering these services. And on the back of that, I welcome what Arlene Key said about the role of the voluntary sector in providing that. However, I would, I would put forward that the new funding scheme doesn't recognise that a sizable proportion of young people working with thousands, or sorry, a sizable proportion of groups working with thousands of young people, often those most marginalised, are being left out of this new funding scheme. 
The eligi eligibility cri criteria creates unnecessary barriers for many groups. Uh, and out of our network of 27, I would say in the past 24 hours, um, on alerting our, our members that this, this meeting's going ahead, the majority of those who've got back to me have said that they, they are projecting uh, a deficit. One organisation phoned me this morning to say that without infrastructure funding, they would potentially close within 12 months. And this is a huge organisation representing a large group of uh, young people and working with large groups in community, like community and voluntary uh, and neighbourhood level, I should say. Um, the, the Priorities Review talks about a model, um, it talks about as the sector moves away from the current delivery model um, and structures to the proposed arrangements, it is important that the quality of services for young people is not adversely affected in this transitional period. So the points I've just made sort of highlight our concern that that line on Priorities for Youth, um, for me, jumps out, that, th that there will be, um, or there potentially will be, uh, an adverse um, you know, this will impact groups adversely on the ground. Uh, funding for youth provision will also be consistent and transparent, proportionate to disadvantage, and recognise the contribution made by the voluntary sector. So that's stated in, in, in priorities for youth, and Arlene Key did recognise that, which is to be welcome, welcomed. Um, committee members will be aware of the work of many other groups in the RVYO network, and priorities for youth states that resources must be used to, allocate, to meet the needs of young people. For me, the new funding scheme does not recognise that regional groups deliver frontline services to young people. For example, there is a stipulation to be eligible for strategic funding that organisations must support other groups who, um, who are registered with EA. Um, and I think, I think in, EA, in Arlene Key's um, presentation of the, the breakdown of numbers, so she, she referenced 75% for frontline services and 10% for RVYOs. That to me demonstrates a lack of understanding that RVYOs also deliver frontline services. For our organisation, we, our members are young people. We're working with young people who are homeless, who are under threat from paramilitary groups, who are long-term unemployed, who have nowhere else to go. Those young people cannot be members. Can, they cannot be organisations. An, an individual young person cannot be an organisation. And that, that is a, a huge barrier for ourselves and many other organisations. As I say, there's there's loads of them have contacted me in the last 24 hours to say they can't get through eligibility because of this. Um, EA will be aware that most youth work is, taken, is undertaken by um, non-EA registered groups. And this is often with young people who are the most marginalised in our society. EA has a responsibility to all young people, not just those who attend registered groups. Unlike other funders, EA distinguish between regional and local funding. We have six strands for funding within the scheme. If we look at if we look at other funders such as Big Lottery, um, they fund youth work. Youth work is what they're looking for. They're looking for beneficiaries. It's not they're not discriminated against based on geography. Uh, it doesn't come down to registration. I mean, we have a charities commission. We have all these other pieces of legislation that ensure that our, our work is quality assured and that we're safeguarding our children and young people as best as we can. I suppose my call is about parity. Um, we welcome the fact that many groups will benefit, and I should stress that there are many groups in our network that will benefit from this. Local groups will do really well, and that's to be welcomed. That's, for me, that's a, that's a fantastic thing. Um, but th the fact of the matter is that there are many groups that will miss out, and for me it shouldn't be. The, the new funding scheme shouldn't be rolled out to the detriment of one group against another, or one set of groups uh, against another. Um, EA talked about the time they invested in answering questions and engagement with the sector. They talked about opportunities to work in partnership. I would put to the committee that those opportunities and those engagements were only open to part of the sector. And as I say, there are, there are people within our network that feel left out of those conversations. They feel marginalised and they feel that their voice, voices have been ignored and not heard. Um, I, have, I have some notes about process here, but I think, I think I'll pause there because I've thrown a lot of information at you, and I would like to... Our challenge is me giving you a coherent message about a very complex issue. Um, so I'll pause, and I would welcome any any questions from yourself for clarity. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for uh, being able to meet with us today and, and to bring 
the, the presentation before us. Um, I think we have already agreed to seek information with regards to the total budget for each uh, funded stream and the criteria for each funded stream. So we will seek that information and be able to share that with you. Um, I, I'm conscious that this is a this is a model that is now being yeah. implemented. Yeah. Um, notwithstanding that, there are obviously you're raising a number of concerns, and I think we as a committee are obliged to make sure we have raised those and received a response to them. Um, it might be I would propose maybe if you could provide us maybe in writing with some of those key concerns um, that, that you've spoken to today. Um, and I would propose as a committee that we would forward those to Arlene Key and the Education Authority to seek a response on your behalf. Um, I'm also open-minded as well for us to um, facilitate engagement between the Education Authority and Arlene Key and some of the, the organisations that you've spoken about who who feel like they haven't been heard or responded to on these matters. Um, if, if there's one thing that um, I work to avoid and that most of us work to avoid, it's anybody feeling like they're in that position where they haven't been communicated with properly, they haven't been heard properly, um, and to consider all possible ways for them to be included and to, to be eligible for application for these streams, however difficult they do consider it to be to access them at this stage. Um, any other members, any responses in, in that regard or questions? Yeah, I'll bring Deputy Chair in and then Robbie Butler. Yep. I suppose I thank you for coming in and it, and it is for myself it's trying to process and get my head around, of it, around it so I do think we have to have more conversations after this. Coming from uh, my city, um, and we have been severely underinvested in relation to uh, youth funding because of the legacy funding. Um, and the, some of the wards in my constituency are the most disadvantaged, and we couldn't have access. Coming from uh, the community and voluntary sector and working, in, and I started off working in a community and voluntary uh, through the Western Education and Library Board, then I went down to the voluntary, you know. So I'm, uh, so I'm quite aware of the sector, but not as a youth worker, so I'm not going to say that I, I totally understand what you're saying. I'm starting to see um, the funding make a difference, um, particularly to voluntary groups in my city that never had, a, had access before um, and been able to get access through youth funding, but that's not to say that I, you know, that I have missed out you know, in, in terms of the sector. I would be concerned that it would be the detriment to all our youth providers and organisations, um, like some of the ones that you, you have here in your, um, within your 27 youth organisations. So I do think to get our head around it, we need a wee bit more detail. I am really concerned when you say that you're uh, around communication, issues not being addressed, groups not being involved in the consultant consultation process because we had met a number of times with EA around um, the model that they were going out um, to seek assurances in terms of who was and how and all that because we were very critical in the past of some of the, the processes that they had. So um, I suppose I, I believe that it was wide reaching and they put on quite a number but maybe that's not the case but I, I would like to, as Chris said, maybe more detail on, on, on what wasn't addressed, who wasn't included, why that wasn't taken forward. Um, we would need that evidence to take to the Education Authority. And just really, um, I suppose again, let's get your head around how we've been told, and Catherine asked the question this morning, that all groups can apply. So, you know, why some of the groups, and it may have to be looking at some of these groups individually, because they all do different things. Um, so why can they not get through the eligibility to apply? Well, more have been told by the Education Authority. Yeah. All groups can apply. So again, look, just maybe it's a, a lack of understanding in, in, in my part on, on some of this, so I would welcome more information. Can I just say, just on, on a few of them points, on something that I, I've, I didn't mention in my input, which may help answer all of our questions, is that the Education Authority carried out an impact audit on, on what what the potential impact on the, the voluntary sector, and particularly the regional voluntary sector, that this new funding scheme may have. We were never spoken to. None of, our, none of the groups were spoken to about this audit. 
It was carried out very much behind closed doors. I asked for that audit in October and it was processed as a Freedom of Information request. I received notification back from EA in January, three months later, that they wouldn't release this information. <coughs> so not only does that breach the, the guidelines in terms of releasing information, but it's almost like if I audited you and you asked me to see that audit, it, it shows a total lack of respect. Um, so I think it's pertinent that we all get sight of this. I heard in the last couple of days as well that the EA conducted a similar, um, a similar audit. I'm not sure as regards to the accuracy of that, but I do know that the EA carried one out. Um, and I just, I just want to make a wee comment about improved outcomes. I, I think it's brilliant that young people uh, in Derry and, and other areas across the north are, are benefiting from in, enhanced funding. I think it's, it's fantastic. But I do have a wee problem here. That, and Ar Arlene said that um, the new funding scheme has resulted in improved outcomes. The new funding scheme isn't published. So I, I, I beggar's belief as to how groups are getting funding without a funding process in place. So I think questions need to be asked about what the process is. Why are certain groups getting handed funding? How is that funding being allocated? Why is it not open to everyone across the sector? And as I say, the small point here is it's brilliant. It's brilliant that young people are benefiting, but there's no parity. For me, certain groups are getting handed money this way, and other groups are getting buyers up the other way. And I think, Chris, the, the, the network of 27 organisations, some of them will uh, benefit from this new funding scheme, and it's, and it's to be welcomed. Um, and some of them have said that to me. For others, our response to the consultation was, we're just not sure because we don't know the detail. And therefore, we listed our questions. And EA have a copy of this submission that we gave to you. And DE got a copy of it. So they know what the questions are. And they just haven't all been answered. So it's just there's a sense of uncertainty. That's, that's why we want uh, to get answers. And some of the questions you asked yourself, Chris, um, to, to the EA reps that were here, and so we welcome we welcome answers to some of the detail um, around the funding scheme. That's the key for us. <clears throat> okay, okay. Members have been advised that we actually may have to vacate the room in the, the next uh, few minutes. So I'll keep us moving on. But um, I, I, I think the emerging action here is for you to provide us with a, you know, a good, comprehensive list of questions that need to be submitted and or requests for uh, audits and that we can submit those and then consider at that stage what other action is needed at that point. Robbie and is is that agreed? <laughs> agreed members? Okay, okay. great. Um, Robbie, Robbie and Robin left to come in briefly. Yeah, Thanks. Very briefly and I'm sure you'll pick it up Chris with, with regard to what the chair has just said. So I'm interested to find out a wee bit more um, and may not be for this meeting just you, you give us an example of where some uh, uh, organisations will not be able to access money, uh, funding due to the fact that they're not working in partnership or with a, another identified EA group. Uh, and is that a departure from what was previously there? Yeah, the big thing here is eligibility criteria. So the feedback that I'm hearing a lot of is that the groups simply can't get through eligibility. I had identified this a long time ago and highlighted it to DE and EA, but there was no follow up. And the outworking is unfortunately, we are where we are. The, f the funding scheme is published. But there's groups, I mean, I've, I've written a list of 18 groups there that I don't think will get through eligibility out of the, out of the 27. And is that a departure from the previous funding? Uh, that's what I'm saying, is it, is it that a departure from what was previously there then? Is that a new ask in this new funding? Yeah, it's figure? a changing of the goalposts. It's right, a of the goalposts. Part of the challenge is you don't know the eligibility criteria just yet either. Yeah, or yeah, The detail of yeah. the streams, right. um, okay. so the specifications are still to be... Okay, which uh, we'll which, request. Which, yeah. which we'll request, which, which will help. The registration issue has been confusing as well. Okay. Like, you know, so for a regional voluntary uh, organisation to be to be funded under Stream 1 for regional strategic organisations, they have to be supporting groups that are registered with EA. And yeah. ma many of our groups are not currently uh, registered with EA. And that's that's presenting a, a lot of uncertainty for some of the is, groups. Is it... Is, it is, is there a barrier to becoming registered with EA? I, I think most a lot of a lot of voluntary run groups don't need to, or you know, it's an extra layer, layer of bureaucracy. You know, for a lot of like if you think of a church group or a, a neighbourhood, I don't know, Irish language group or whatever, there's there's no need for that level of bureaucracy. The other thing around registration, I would add, 
when regional body, when regional groups are applying for funding or go through the eligibility criteria, uh, lo local groups have to state one RVYO that is their support mechanism. So for our within our network, you might have twelve RVYO supporting one local group. So they might be one group might be providing child protection training, another one might be providing training on youth, I don't know, participation. So what's happening as well is that we're getting siloed. Um, EA are asking groups to say, well, look, I, I want to work with Andy, but not with William or whatever, you know. Um, and that's going to further marginalise groups further down the line. Okay. A, a potential solution which we'd suggested there was if the RVYO was registered with EA, would that suffice as a, as a, as a qualification for, for accessing funding? You know, if, if, if if Northern Ireland Youth Forum was registered as an as a with EA, could all the various groups that you know okay. that they wouldn't then need to? Yeah. Well, we can explore those further. Bring Robin in here just to finish her question. Very yeah. short question. Yeah. Sure. I mean, you, the, the the list of organisations that you represent are disparate uh, yeah. in terms of some of them are national organisations, yeah. um, others very specialist organisations, others are I think quite small organisations. Yeah. To join the network, what does that actually mean? What do they do to join the network and what do they get for joining the network? The yeah. network was originally, there used to be an organisation called YouthNet, which you may remember that operated yeah. a number of years ago, and that was an umbrella body for regional groups that, that operated here. YouthNet folded a few years ago, and as a result of that, a number of people within the sector put a paper to EA and DE with regards to how we could fill that void. Um, so to be a member of the network, th there's no strict criteria. You know, it's traditionally it's about uh, youth work organisations who are providing services. If, on our if I pick any one of them in there, what do they have to do to join the network? Be, in, be a youth work organisation providing services on a regional they sign basis. up. Pardon? Do they sign up? It's, it's no, very it's, informal, it's an you know, informal network. So we're not we're not constituted. We don't have a you know a specific constitution. We're not an established charity. Um, so it's an informal network which meets se six seven times a year, uh, but then would also be represented on various EA subcommittees on the RAG committee, um, practice development group, planning and monitoring. But outside of EA stuff, we would collaborate together on projects say around mental health there was one there was an example of that in the last couple of weeks you know where a number of organizations got together or arts based organizations sharing resources there was a fair bit of collaboration amongst the network all right okay thanks very much indeed for coming today um we've got agreed items there to follow up and we'll be sure to bring those back to you as soon as we can and obviously there'll be ongoing engagement with the network and with individual organisations that you represent as yeah. as well. Really, sure. really value the work that you're doing and thank you for presenting to us today. Thanks for your time. Appreciate All right, it. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, members, we've agreed our, our actions already in relation to this item, so the clerk can um, go through correspondence uh, briefly for us here just before we finish the meeting for today. So, Chairperson, okay. members, at uh, page 299, there's a summary note of the item of correspondence. I can ask, is the committee content just to dispose of the correspondence? in line of the amendment the index sheet, Agreed. with the exception of, like, do you want a briefing next week on the nutritional standards for school food, which has gone out to consultation recently? So I've asked the department for an update to uh, appropriate. Yeah. Okay, okay, then. Then we have this getting up the lunchtime. Yes, also, uh, would members like a uh, formal briefing from Book Trust NI as part of the committee's consideration of the budget? They have a budget issue. Um, which came to the predecessor committees quite a few times. I think it, it'll be a fairly brief uh, addition. Members are content. Yeah. At some point. Okay. And then, um, additionally, then I think we'll clear everything else. Yeah, the Control School Support Council wrote to the chair asking for the meeting. What the uh, chair has suggested to me informally is that uh, uh, Clark puts together an informal meeting with all of the sectoral bodies, the Control Schools, CCMS, Transfer, CNG, NICE and the Catholic Schools Trustee Service. So this would be an informal meeting at some lunchtime in the future. Hopefully the Chair and Deputy Chair and maybe other members would come along just to meet with them all as in a sort of an efficient way to uh, meet with all of these different groups and hear their views, content to in, do that. Yeah, in no way to negate their opportunity to come and Absolutely. brief the committee in open session, but just by way of an initial engagement. 
Members content? Yeah. And likewise, Children's Law Centre is looking for an informal um, meeting on a similar uh, vein so that they might be interesting around uh, special educational needs. So we'll try and arrange that if members are agreed. Great. And then in terms of visits, I think the, uh, sorry, I'm sort of moving kind of into forward work forward program. Forward program, yep. Okay, is that uh, the chair suggested that maybe the committee visit the Lockshore Educational Resource Centre in North Belfast. And I think the deputy chair had a suggestion. Uh, Boyd Community Centre. Foyle Learning Community. Area Learning Community. Yeah. yeah, so very briefly, the Lockshore Educational Resource Centre is obviously uh, education other than at school provision. Um, and I would intend that to be looking at that particular theme. Um, vulnerable children um, have been raised on a number of occasions. Um, I think we could do that. Um, I think pre predecessor committee had engaged well with area learning communities mm -hmm. as well. Um, in informal meeting capacity and in uh, public meeting as well. So I, I personally think visiting area learning communities uh, means you're engaging with a wide range of schools, mm -hmm. sectors, uh, providers. So I'd be more than content to do that and be open to suggestions of other area learning communities to visit as well. So members, happy to agree foil on this occasion if that's okay. Yep. If members will suggest an actual place to go to that I can contact yeah. and uh, I'll sort that out. I'll confirm that up there tomorrow. Okay. Thanks Chair, uh, Deputy Chair as well. Yeah. Um, just the other thing was just to remind members that um, special school principals, we think the, um, we wanted this to be the 18th of February, I think they're saying the 11th of February, so it will be lunchtime um, Tuesday. I think the Chair and Deputy Chair have indicated they're free, so hopefully other members could come along as well. I'll send you a text to remind you, but just to... Such as Turn, turn, deputy, turn. No problem. <laughs> Tuesday, the 11th of February, 1 to 2 p.m. for members' information. All right. And so that next week, then, we will have a, will be a briefing on the framework, the mental health and wellbeing framework. We'll have a quick briefing on nutritional standards. Then we'll go into closed. Uh, assembly research are going to come along and just do a wee recap on educational underachievement. Um, and I'll, um, uh, by way of giving us some structure, if members are happy, and then we can plan out the rest of the mandate, not the rest of the mandate, but the rest of the session, which will get us to uh, the summer. So only 20 short more meetings to go, members, before we get to the yeah. summer. Short. Short. No, it'll be short. I short haven't was. heard from the minister and the department and the education authority. That was a good set of initial briefings to inform our, our planning session next Wednesday then. Okay, members, uh, any other business? No, okay. The next committee meeting will be Wednesday, 12th of February, 9.45 a.m. in room 30. Uh, I put the question, committee meeting does now adjourn. Agreed? Agreed. Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.